Well, hello and welcome to the OTR Visual Radio. We're continuing our series of old-time radio shows that featured your favorite movie characters and stars. So tonight we've got The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. The show was based on Raymond Chandler's private detective, Philip Marlowe. It was originally broadcast on CBS beginning in 1948 until 1950. Gerald Moore played Marlowe. And in fact, he would play Marlowe in every episode except one. In 1950, William Conrad played Marlowe in the episode The Anniversary Gift. Now, this wasn't Marlowe's first foray into radio. He was originally brought to radio by Dick Powell in the Lux Radio Theater adaptation of the 1944 film Murder My Sweet. Then in 1947, Van Heflin would play Marlowe on NBC. Marlowe would return in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe in 1948. Now, of course, Moore had started films beginning in the late 1930s. So tonight's show features a movie character played by movie actor on the radio. Now, just before we get into the show, do want to take a minute to tell you about a couple ways you can help support the channel. First up, we've got the Johnny Dollar Club starting at just a dollar a month. You can help keep these great shows coming. You've got three ways to join coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com and patreon.com. The links for those are in the description below. And many of you have asked about using PayPal. So if you prefer PayPal, the first option, coffee.com, is a great one for you. And the second way you can help support the channel and get a little something for yourself is to check out our Hearth and Home shop on Etsy. We've got a great assortment of old-time radio-related merchandise, including the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar collection. We've got the old-time radio detective mug series. And our newest collection, starting right now, is, is the Harold Apple Knocker collection. The link for the Etsy shop is in the description below. Head on over and check that out. Now it's time to get on with our program. And of course, tonight's version of the OTR Visual Radio also features the sights and sounds of a crackling fireplace. Well, now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy Gerald Moore in the adventures of Philip Marlowe. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. This time it started as a routine search for a rich girl's fiancé, and the trail led to a silent house haunted by a face at the window and blood in an open cedar chest. But before it was over, it became a search for a cop that wouldn't sit still. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story... The Busy Body. Phone jerked me up off my back and out of the sports page at 9.30 in the evening of an already too long day. On the other end was a warm, feminine voice, edged with a kind of self-assurance that means money, and lots of it. But the words were both hurried and panicky, so after I hung up, I reluctantly waded through the sports section with my feet instead of my eyes and headed to the coffee shop at Franklin and Bronson, where my new client, who had identified herself as Liz Stewart, said she'd be waiting. A pair of blue eyes at a table in the corner measured me from haircut to shoelaces, so I took the cue and walked over. After we introduced ourselves, I was waved into the chair opposite her. She leaned toward me and started with a rush. Mr. Marlow, I've got to find a man named Dean Howard as soon as possible. Not exactly a new switch. He's my fiancé. We plan to notify my Uncle Hanley of our engagement tonight. Who is Uncle Hanley? Uncle Hanley Stewart of Stewart Aluminum. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Dean, Dean Howard was to meet me at 7, but he didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And then about a quarter to 8, he called. He started to tell me something about... Something that he referred to as a horrible mistake, but before he could get it out, we were cut off. Well, I tried to Want call him... coffee? Hmm? Coffee! Uh, no, no. Well, okay. I, I tried to call him back, but there was no answer. So I went to his house, but it was locked and dark. And yet his car was still parked outside. Uh-huh. Well, look, Miss Stewart, why don't you save yourself 50 bucks, go home and wait for an apologetic phone call, huh? What do you mean? Well, this stacks up as being a case of cold feet or a little celebration that got out of hand. Either way, there's nothing to worry about. I've come to you for help, Marlo, not a pat on the head. Okay, okay. I'll assume it's my error for the moment. How long have you known this Dean Howard? Well, I, I met him at a party about three months ago. Mm -hmm. Uncle Hanley and I both liked him tremendously right from the first. I suppose you've considered the possibility of another woman? Well, of course, I'm not a child. I can see that. Well, <laughs> Dean has been deeply troubled for the past week. He wouldn't tell me why, but I, I'm certain that this business tonight is tied in with it. Something's wrong, and I want you to find out what it is. 
All right. But I'm no leg man for Cupid, so if it turns out to be nothing more than a guy's heart beating in double time, I drop it. Fair enough? Fair enough. She gave me a short list of plush joints she and Dean Howard sometimes visited. And his address, which was 312 Normandy. She said I could reach her at home, which was 28 Roxbury Drive in Beverly Hills. Well, 50 bucks is 50 bucks, so after she left, I spent a handful of nickels checking the list by phone and drew a complete blank. So I drove out Los Feliz to Normandy and found the number, 312. As I walked up to the door and leaned on the bell, I got the feeling that I was being watched. There was no answer, so I tried the door. It was locked. I threw a look over my shoulder as I walked around the side of the house and caught a glimpse of a face in a window next door, just before the curtain was dropped back into place. The back door of 312 was locked, too, I found out, as did the face next door, which was watching me again from one of the rear windows. There was one answer to that, so I went out in the street and up the steps of the house next door and knocked, good and loud. What do you want? My name's Marlowe, lady. I'm a detective. You may be able to help me. A detective? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, come right in, Marlowe. It's about time, all I have to say. I'm Agatha Lambrigger. What's he been up to? Who? Well, you're investigating that bachelor next door, aren't you? Yes. Oh, <laughs> how'd you know? Huh. Stands the reason. I've known all along he's a suspicious character. Yeah? Lived there a year now. Comes and goes at all hours. Drives that fancy car out there. Wears fine clothes, but nobody seems to know what he does or where he gets all his money. Well, look, Mrs. Lamb... And Lam- girl! Oh. Well, believe you me, they don't come to clean his house. Hmm. Never gets cleaned. But they come just the same. Why, only tonight there was one. Some blonde in a white dress. I tell you, I've never... Mrs. Lambrigger, did the girl go inside? Well, no. But she tried to. The door was locked. <laughs> and it's uh, Miss Lambrigger. Oh, how stupid of me. <laughs> well, tell me, did you notice Mr. Howard come home tonight? Well, I didn't exactly see him come home. But he was over there all right. And not alone either. Is that so? Another girl? No, no, it was only some man. Oh. But it still bears out what I've been saying. Because I just happened to glance out of my window at this one here across uh-huh. from that one of his, you see. Yes, sir. Well, a light was on over there. And I could look straight down the hallway. And do you know what? What? Those two grown men were roughhousing like a pair of hoodlums in that hall. Wrestling they were like ordinary ruffians. I tell you, I never saw the like. I got a good look at him and I'd certainly know him if I saw him again. Mm. Well, how'd the fight come out? Fight? Yeah. What the? Oh, oh, the fight. Well, well, I can't say about that. My phone rang. It was Lenore Crowley. She simply talked her ear off when she gets started. Mm. So when I finally got back to the window, uh, well, when I happened to look out again, it was dark over there. So I never did find out what actually happened. But yes, I well, think thanks he... very much for your help. I really must run. Oh, and another thing. The noise and the drinking that's gone on in that house. Why, you wouldn't believe it. Oh, you're leaving? As soon as possible, yes. Yeah. Oh, but you, you still haven't told me what he's up to. Well, I'm not at liberty to do that. I, uh... Oh, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Well, I'll be here all the time, you know, and I'll certainly keep an eye on that house. Oh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate from you're going to all this trouble just for me. <laughs> Bonsoir, Miss Slambrigger. Backed out of that wind tunnel, got in my car, and drove noisily around the corner. Then I cut my lights, turned quietly into an alley behind the house, and stopped. Slipped through Howard's back gate and up the side of the house, found a window that could be persuaded, and went in. Eh, Howard was a lousy housekeeper, and everything that didn't get brushed off in normal traffic was covered with dust. I found my way to the room opposite Agatha Lambrigger's observation window and ran smack into her first lie. Where she said there was a hallway, there was a solid wall papered with purple roses and hung with four dingy pictures in bronze frames, two on each side of a big, ugly mirror. There were two hallways, but no angle at which either could be seen from her window. Furthermore, there was no sign of a struggle. One hall led to the study, the other to the bedroom, and I checked both. But still, there was no indication of a fight. On my way out, I barked my shin on the nose of a lion carved on the corner of an oversized cedar chest. Just as the abrupt sound of someone at the door brought me to a rigid halt. Whoever it was, had the patience of an eight-year-old on circus day. So I set myself up as a type who might live in a joint like this and entered. Uh, What's the matter with the lights, Howard? Blow a fuse? Or could this be some new economy measure? I like it this way. I don't think I know you. You should, Howard, you should. I called you yesterday about a certain money matter. 
The name is Leo. Uh, don't go for your gun, Howie. Well, since yours is pointed at my third rib, why should I? Like I told you on the phone, my boss is anxious. You're way overdue, Howard. I want that 50 grand the boss loaned you three months ago. Have it for me the day after tomorrow. All of it. Without fail. He knows I'm good for my debts. Why all the pressure? Well, maybe he figures your investments aren't so smart. Like maybe you've been blowing too much on that second-rate canary, Carol. Oh. Oh, yeah, Carol. I remember. Mm. She's your girl. Yeah, well, that's none of my business. See you day after tomorrow about the same time. And if you get a headache from worrying about paying off, just think of the one you'll have if you don't pay. It'll be like ten times this. Oh. Good night. A forty-five in his hand caught the side of my head. And I went out cold. When I opened my eyes, the room had shrunk until there wasn't enough space left to stretch out in. And the climb to my feet oh. <clears throat> was as easy as roller skating through a log jam. And it wasn't until I found a match and had a light that I knew why. Somebody had moved me from the front door and crammed me into a broom closet like a bag of wet wash. When I got out, I saw that my cubby hole was off the hall of the bedroom. I listened, but there was no sound in the house, so I started moving. But stopped when I noticed something else. A big cedar chest with carved lions on the corners that had been closed before and now was standing open. I struck another match. Inside on the bottom was a thick red puddle of blood. Blew out the match and was in the middle of a metal apology to Liz Stewart when it came. I ran for the front door in time to see Agatha charge out of the driveway and down the street. Stark terror twisting her face. Help! Help! Hey, Help! Miss Lambringer, hold it! Oh, Mr. Marlowe! Mr. Marlowe! What is it? What happened? I saw him, Mr. Marlowe, I saw him! Oh, but the alley near the hedge. He's dead, Mr. Marlowe, dead in my backyard. All right, all right, now take it easy, Agatha. Who was it? He's there now, lying on his back close to the hedge, and he's dead. What'll we do? Come on, we'll have a look. You can show me where he is. All right, he's right back here. I I happened to look out my rear window, and I I saw something move. The the dogs had been getting in my pansy lately, and I I thought this was another. So I came out to chase him away. That's when I saw the body. Right back here. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Now look, Miss Lambrigger, I've got a headache. I'm getting a little tired of this. You saw a body here just like you saw a fight in a hallway from your window. You're so anxious to be in the middle of things, you'd make up any kind of a story. No, I'm not. I'm not. I I saw that, Python. I saw Dean Howard's body, too. It it was here, I tell you. Where? Show me exactly. Well, right right about there, I tell you. Oh, sure, sure. And I suppose it... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah... My apologies, baby. There is something here. Could be blood. Just two dimes and a bar receipt from the tulip room on the strip. Oh, good heavens. What do you do now? Raid the place? Y- you can use my phone. Well, thanks, but until we know where the body is, we better play it cagey. Now, let's keep this a secret between us. That'll take a lot of courage, I know, but I can trust you, oh, can't I? I? I won't open my mouth to a soul, Mr. Marlowe. Well, that's Marlo. great. That's splendid. Now, you better go inside and stay there until you hear from me. Who knows? You may yet be a heroine, Miss Lambrigger. The bar receipt was a long shot When I was still two blocks away from the tulip room I knew it had paid off Because a fluorescent banner, 4x12 Draped over the front of a squat square building Extolled the vocal virtues of one Carol Cody I parked across the street, went in and found a dressing room door and knocked She distinctly said come in But when I did, I thought the room was empty Until a small handful of spangled satin costume Hopped up from behind a screen in the corner I made a sight unseen introduction. It was only a moment later that a tall brunette, filling a white silk blouse and snug, dark slacks, stepped out, tossed a few pounds of glossy black hair away from her face, and gestured me into a chair. Which paper did you say you were from, Marlowe? I didn't, honey. I'm a private detective. I can't use it. Don't give odds on it, baby. Not yet, anyway, huh? Let's talk first. For instance, what's with you and Dean Howard? Dean Howard is mm. a low crawling thing. That's strange. How did you love him? I did until tonight when I found out that he has two heads. That's so he can lie and keep a straight face with one while he laughs up his sleeve with the other. Nuts to him. Nuts to Liz Stewart and her money and nuts to you. I hate Dean Howard enough to kill him and I might just do that. I don't think you will, no, because somebody beat you to it. You... You mean Howard's dead? 
Looks that way, yeah. I'm not sure because he won't stay in one place long enough. If you're trying to shock me, you're wasting your time. I'm not sorry. When... I think we've got company. Keep talking, I'll get him. Uh, as you say, my friend, the music business is just as lousy as any other dodge, and I can prove it. Come here. You're a good listener, bud, so join the party. Who are you? Why are you listening out there? Come on. Well, no, 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 just, just a minute. I, I wasn't listening. I was looking for you, Marlow. I'm Ward Odom, Mr. Hanley Stewart's assistant. You're doing fine. Don't stop now. Well, I, ever since I learned that Miss Stewart hired you, Marlow, I've been trying to talk to you. I, I followed you here from that place on, on, on Normandy because I must know what you found out so far. Why? What business is it of yours? Because, Mr. Marlow, I doubt very much that you even know of the robbery. Robbery? What robbery? More than $40,000 worth of negotiable securities were stolen from Mr. Stewart's safe this evening. You get all your information? Information at keyholes? Hmm. And I have reason to believe that the man you're looking for took them. Of course, I don't dare accuse him without proof of his relationship with Liz, uh, Mr. Stewart's niece. If I were wrong, it, it would cost me my job. Odom, did Liz know about the robbery when she hired me? Why, why, of course. Oh, brother. Look, see this? Her name is Carol. She's involved right up to her mascara in the whole mess. I'll let her out of your sight till I get back. Me? Why, you cheap shot. Shut up. And as for being cheap, I'll take care of you when I get back. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, three gentlemen with highly varying but equally effective approaches to dealing with crime entertain you with their deeds of daring on CBS every Sunday. Jethro Dumont, alias the Green Llama, Police Commissioner Bill Grant of Call the Police, and Dashiell Hammett, Sam Spade. These three sterling gentlemen all make their appearances tomorrow on most of these same CBS network stations. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Busy Body. After convincing Ward Odom that his greatest contribution to the cause would be staying close, but not too close to the violent lady in slacks, I piled into my car and started for Beverly Hills in a beautiful liar named Liz. I didn't stop until I was at number 28 Roxbury Drive out of my car and walking fast up the semicircle of gravel driveway that led to the carefully antique front door. But then, for two good reasons, I stopped again. The first, a squad car parked ahead of me that said everybody except Marlow knew all about the bonds Mr. Hanley Stewart could no longer call his own. The second reason and more important was my client, Liz Stewart, sneaking out of a side door and hurrying toward a gray coupe. I stepped back into the shadow of a squat palm and waited for her to come abreast of me. Late date, Miss Stewart. What? Marlo, why, you you startled me. Considering everything, it's the least I can do. What do you mean? I don't like clients who lie to me. So if you don't mind, I'll just stroll along with you while you assure me you can explain everything. But I can, Marlo. Just give me a chance, please. All right. Why didn't you tell me that 40 grand worth of negotiable bonds disappeared from your uncle's safe at the same time as Howard? Well, because I didn't want you to be prejudiced, to be looking for a thief from the start. If Dean did take those bonds, he had a reason. Like being fond of money? No, like being forced to do what he did. All right, let's say he was forced. What then? Well, then I wanted to help him. To get to him before the police. They'd arrest him in a minute. And you, on the other hand, would get the bonds back to your uncle, convince him it was all a mistake, and talk him out of telling the law, huh? And with your own dough, you would help Howard out of the spot he was in. Is that it? Yes. But you haven't proved that Dean took the bonds. No, I haven't. Could have been anyone who knew the combination of the library safe. Which includes how many? Uh, aside from Uncle Han and myself, just the, the family lawyer and Mr. Odom. Yeah, what about Odom? Could he have done it, Liz? No, I, I don't think so, as much as I dislike him. Mm. You see, Marlowe, for years, Odom's been very close to Uncle Han. He's had a thousand opportunities to steal if he wanted to, or like this afternoon, for instance. He had $10,000 worth of the bonds with him today. What was he doing with all that dough, paying gas bills? He was going to sell them for my uncle. But the transaction fell through, so he brought them back to the house and put them back in the safe. Anyway, Marlowe, I don't think he'd have the courage to steal. I know what you mean. I've already met Mr. Odom. When? Oh, about a half hour ago. In a nightclub called the Tulip Room. Odom thinks Dean is guilty, Liz, but he's afraid to mention it publicly until he knows a little more. What's a nightclub got to do with Dean? Carol Cody. Who? She's Dean's girlfriend. Marlowe, you're crazy. I talked to her, honey. She's a singer there. Told me that she and Howard were more than chummy, but that she gave him the air tonight when she found out about you. And you believe that? Mm Mm-hmm. Now that I've had a little time, I believe even more. The tales that she never bothered to mention, the tales like Dean Howard and Carol Cody playing you for a sucker. 
He gains your confidence, then the combination of the safe, and then goodbye. But you see, the end was a switch, Liz. Dean d- didn't... Dean didn't what? Hmm? What is it, Marlon? What are you staring at? Back of my car there. It's not gas stripping on the driveway. The color's too red. Liz, stay back. No, Marlo. I don't want to. I want to... <laughs> it's Dean. He's dead, Marlo. <laughs> yeah. That Liz is the switch I was talking about. I think Dean Howard not only crossed you, but Carol Cody as well. She did it. She killed him. She killed him because she... All right, all right. Him. Now listen. Get inside. Tell the police about this. Do you hear me? I... But first, give me a five-minute lead. I'll take your car. I want to get to Carol Cody before the law does. Without saying another word, Liz Stewart, her face drawn and streaked with tears, handed me the keys to her car and turned and walked slowly back to the house. I took one long look at the blood-soaked shirt front on the body I'd had been stepped behind all night, then got into Liz's car and pointed it back toward the tulip room. Twenty minutes later, when my knock on the locked dressing room door brought no answer, I had kicked my way in. Alone and half-conscious in the middle of the floor was Ward Odom, a man I'd assigned to stand sentry over the brunette. Oh, Marlo. Marlo, she tricked me. Asked for a cigarette, and I went to light it. She, she... swung. Made ads, Odom, and you're lucky she let it go at that. It was more permanent than Howard's case. Oh, oh then, then you found his body, Marlo. Yeah, in the trunk of my car. Oh. Oh, how awful. And she did all that, Miss Carol Cody? Yes and no. You must have had help, Odom, because... First of all, it takes something stronger than the chanteurs to keep shifting a corpse from sea to chest to garden to car. The rate that Howard was being moved. And second, an old crow named Agatha Lambriger saw a man roughhousing with Howard over at his own place, not a woman. You, you mean there was a witness to the murder, Marlo? Well, more or less. And you have no idea who the murderer is? No. And that Odom is all the more reason why I want to catch up with Carol Cody. Happen to know where she lives? So why, why, yes, yes, just at the Grayfield Apartment Hotel on mm-hmm. North Havenhurst Drive. It's, North Havenhurst. It's a room, room, or 118. 118. And I think that it's... Marlo! Marlo, wait, my top coat is gone. What? Yes, and she was wearing slacks, remember? Marlo, maybe she's leaving town disguised as a man. It's a point, Odom. I still think I'll try the apartment hotel first. <laughs> Bags over there, boys. You get the test. Marlo, what are you doing here? Not doubling for a bellhop, so get over there, sit down, and keep your hands in your lap, because if I have to, I'll shoot. But I don't understand. I'll make it real plain. I think you murdered Dean Howard because he double-crossed you after he emptied Hanley Stewart's safe. And I think you're out of your mind. Which brings us to a position called stalemate, and that in turn makes this a good time to call the cops. I didn't kill Dean. I swear I didn't. Oh, listen to me. What you said about Dean double-crossing me after he stole the bonds is true, but not the way you think it is. Second verse. He didn't want to just cut me out of my share, Marlowe. He wanted to return all the bonds intact. He really fell in love with Liz Stewart and decided to play All-American Boy. You mean he decided to call it all off after he'd stolen the yes. bonds? Yes, Marlo. That was the reason we argued tonight. Well, it's a stronger reason than the one I already had for your committing murder. Baby, you wanted that money bad. No, you're wrong. Come back here. Why did you belt Odom and run? And don't bother denying that you did because I just left him. And he's minus good health in that top coat over there. So if you think I that you... I can explain that. I, I was scared that a confession out of Dean would get me into hot water. And when you showed and then Odom... Just I... a minute, Carol. Marlo, I... Just a minute, will you? I think I've got the answer. What answer? It's dust, Carol. Dust and what an old gossip swears she saw from her window. Right now, I've got to get over to her place before she ends up looking like the late Mr. Howard. Well, then, then you believe me, Marlowe, about not killing Dean. I don't know. Since you've been in this cheap swindle from the start, we'll what? just tuck you into an old-fashioned wardrobe. Oh, just for safekeeping, no. baby! <laughs> Outside in Liz's car, I slammed my foot down hard against the accelerator and didn't ease up until I screeched to a stop away from 310 North Normandy, where I knew murder was scheduled to happen again. I was next to a pair of half-open French doors to which I could see Agatha Lambriger sitting erect in a straight-back chair. I was happy that I hadn't taken any longer in getting there. I was also happy that the man standing opposite her gun in hand, the man who had murdered Dean Howard, had his back to me. I got a firm grip on the 38 in my hand. So nosy, Miss Lambriger. And it's too bad that Marlowe had to let me know you've been a witness when I killed Dean Howard. A rough house, I think you called it. A rough house is what I thought at the time. But when I saw Dean Howard's body out in the alleyway, I knew... You knew I killed him. Everything would have been simple if you hadn't had your nose out a mile. I was going to run over him. And it would have looked like an accident. But I had to move the body after you saw it. Marlowe's car looked good until I could dispose of it. But there's no point telling you all this. 
You won't be able to gossip about it, Miss Lambringer. I'm sorry. Sorry, but that's the way it has to be. You or me. I vote for you, Autumn. <laughs> drop your gun before I close the pulse for good, real noisy-like. Come on, drop it. No, no, don't shoot. I dropped it, I dropped it. Okay. I move to the middle of the room, hands high. Well, well, I didn't want to do it, but I had to kill him. I had to. Dean Howard was going to return the bonds he took, Marla, and that would have left you in a me. spot, wouldn't it? Because Howard only stole thirty grand out of that safe, you were taking ten grand to legitimately sell for your boss. Yes, I know what. And when you went I to return them, happened. you saw there'd been a theft, and you decided to make the most of it and let somebody else take the rap for the whole forty grand. Oh, Don't, Don't worry, a man who shoots another man in the back has no guts. He won't try anything while I'm looking at him. No, no, Marlo. I. I... I don't have any more guts and it takes to jump behind a woman's skirt. Olivia, I choked to death. Could you take one more step? Now lower your gun and listen. All right. Let her go, Autumn. Sure. Sure, let her go. Just as long as you cooperate, Milo. Milo. Milo, don't be a Shut fool. Up. Shut Milo, up. Milo, shoot. You kill me anyway. Shoot. No. Shoot. Milo, shoot. Milo, don't shoot. Milo, don't shoot. 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 You were right, Marlo. No guts. It was an ambulance, a half a dozen squad cars, and a police captain included, and three long hours of questions and answers and triplicate later. Before 310 North Normandy and Environ settled back to being just another quiet house on just another quiet street. With, of course, the exception of Miss Agatha Lambrigger, who now would never return to normalcy. <laughs> As we sipped hot tea together and a clock someplace deep in another room struck twice. Now, Philip, uh, I'm sure I had this She advice. was still going strong. Dean Howard owed money, so he and that worthless singer decided that he should get friendly with your wealthy client and then at the propitious moment rob her uncle, correct? Correct, yeah. But what I don't understand is how you knew it was that awful man Odom. Well, there were two things, honey. His anxiety to get me to Carol, together with a streak of dust the length of Odom's topcoat sleeve, all added up to a hunch. That, Philip, I don't understand. Well, you gotta take him in reverse order. I saw dust on Odom's topcoat sleeve when I was in Carol Cody's apartment. That reminded me of the dust all over Howard's place. Oh, I messed that up. Yeah, luckily. And the dust was the length of the sleeve, as though somebody had brushed against the wall, coated thick with it. As one would in searching for something, hmm? That's right, that's right. Now, there's another thing. You saw Howard and another man roughhousing in a hall by looking out of that window there. Mm-hmm. Where, Miss Lambrigan, no hall is visible. But where there is a mirror. Oh, then you mean I actually saw a reflection. Yes, darling, you did. Dean Howard hid the bonds behind the mirror. Which tilted so that I saw the reflection of a side hall. That's right. Well, n- now, Philip, one last question. Why did Odom move the body? Well, if it's the last, I'll answer it. <laughs> because he didn't want Howard's death to appear a murder on the night the bonds were stolen. It was better if he died accidentally and wasn't connected with the theft. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, now, look, well, Miss Excuse Lam- me, I'll only be a minute. Yeah, but Miss Lambert... Hello? Oh, hello, Judith. Yes, yes, wasn't it thrilling? Miss Lambrigger, oh, really, I... Darling, it all started so innocently. My part, I mean. Well, it was about ten. Miss Lambrigger, I Maybe. have... Uh, Philip, I'll be with uh, you in a minute. Oh. Uh, Philip, who? Why, the detective, the one I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier. A long minute, I'm sure. Who? Well, you have to do it. And you have to do it. And you have to do it. Goodbye, girl. <laughs> when I got outside, the silence was deafening. And then I remembered that I still had a client up on Roxbury Drive who I had to see. And that there were automobiles to be exchanged, and maybe, if I could find them, some right words to say to a girl who had a very rough night. So I started driving that way, slowly. But ten minutes later, when I was halfway there, I stopped, turned around, and headed back to 310 North Normandy. And my 38 that I'd forgotten after a handful of policemen had finished examining it. It wasn't until I was at Agatha Lambriga's front door again that I realized something more important. Well, then this Odom, this killer, grabbed me as a shield, Judith, and told Marlo he had guts enough... (laughs) Guts was his word, my dear... Yes, well, I could get my gun another day. The 
Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and cr- star, Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lois Corbett, Lorette Philbrandt, Lynn Allen, Peter Leeds, and John Stevenson. The special music is by Richard O'Rant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It began as a threat of a beating that journeyed into murder with a brown-eyed blonde, a jovial hippopotamus, and a tough ex-soldier of fortune. All complicating the problem until I got next to the key man. Will you be listening when $51,000 go on the block during Sing It Again tonight? 26000 in fabulous prizes for solving the mystery of the Phantom Voice. And additional 25000 in cold, hard cash for answering only one more question about the Phantom. There's many another prize, too, for unriddling the smart, tuneful little riddle songs that keep Sing It Again moving at a terrific clip for the hour that it's on the air. It'll be here a little later on most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. This one began as a threat of a beating that turned into murder with a brown-eyed blonde, a jovial hippopotamus, and a tough ex-soldier of fortune, all complicating the problem until I got next to the key man. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, star of Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Key Man. Along about dusk, Hollywood Boulevard is some desolate place between the end of work and the start of play. And about as boisterous as taps. So except for a sallow-faced masher leaning against the nearby storefront warming up his evening leer, I was alone on a lot of fancy pavement when I walked up to the box office of the Newsreel Theater near Cahuenga. Paid my 40 cents admission tax included and started inside, where, of all places, I was to meet my new client, one Mark Hummel. He'd called my office at 6.35, and in a tight voice, fringed with fear, urged me to find him in the last row, last seat, far left of the Boulevard Cinema at once, if I could use a $50 bill. It was exactly a quarter to seven when I crossed the length of lobby to aisle four and entered the theater proper, which was almost empty. It was two minutes after that before I could see well enough to tell that the man all alone in the aforementioned seat who wore white French cuffs protruding out of gray flannel, a pleated frown and not paying any attention to bathing beauties on the screen who were water skiing through Florida's Cypress Gardens had to be my client. I eased in and sat down next to him. I could see he was watching me out of the corner of his eye. Marlo? Yeah. My plane leaves for New York in half an hour. Watch it, honey. You ought to see that I'm on it and in good health. Who wants it otherwise? Barney Kovac, an ex-soldier of fortune who thinks with his fists. He works as store boss in a garage where they park cars. He's threatened to kill me with his bare hands. Why? What'd you do? Nothing, nothing. It was perfectly legitimate. Mm -hmm. He had a chance to get out of Hippo Link's place. Uh, Get out of whose place? Hippo Link. Oh. Uh, Kovac had a chance to buy a location of his own. But you got there first. Look, Mr. Hummer, why don't we continue this in the lounge? It's quieter out there. Uh, Yes, with a few feet. Yeah, yeah, come on. Uh Oh, this is better. Uh, Come on, we can talk over here. Hmm? So, uh, you beat Kovac out of the property he wanted. Then what happened? Uh, When he found out, he went crazy. (laughs) He swore I bribed the real estate broker, high-pressured the owner. (gasps) All that kind of wild talk, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, Marlow, the place I bought from under him is a good investment. Oh, yes, yes. But chicken feed compared to the deal I'm going to close in New York tomorrow. (laughs) If I get there. So, for 50 bucks, I'm to see that you do just that, huh? Uh, Yes, but I've already uh, made your work easier. I told Hippo Link... uh, 
All 300 pounds of it. No. I told him in a loud voice this afternoon that I was going out of town by train at seven tonight, figuring, of course, that Kovac, who's nearby, but wouldn't do anything with people around, would uh, overhear me. Mm -hmm. And your connection with Hippo is what? I parked my car in his garage. Period. Anyhow, at 5.30 tonight, I drove downtown to the Union Station. I left my car on the lot there and went inside. After which you doubled back, got outside into a cab and headed for here in a comfortable wait until plane time, which you're afraid might not fool anybody, including the tough Mr. Kovac, since you've hired me, right? Uh, yes, that's right. I never caught sight of him trailing me, Milo, and uh, frankly, well, I'm... I'm afraid of him. Can you understand that? Sure. Fear is always understandable. Well, what's the itinerary, Mr. Hummel? Here to the airport? Uh, no, 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 no. First to my house. I still have a bag to pack. I'll take a cab. You follow in your car. Then wait outside my place. That's 4100 Fountain. And just below La Siena. Yeah, I know. Yes. Now, uh, when I get back into the cab, you follow again. Until I'm safe aboard the plane. Yes. Now, here. Here's your money. Right. Anything else? <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you carry a gun, Mr. Hummel? Ordinarily, no. But tonight, Marla, yes. It's a service gun. 45. And believe me, if I have to use it, I will. Now, let's get out of here. Quickly. I was 20 minutes playing follow the leader up through Hollywood to Fountain Avenue as far as the neat cube of stucco that was number 4100, where I parked behind the taxi lights out and waited until I heard a frightened scream from what had to be Mark Hummel. I piled out of my car and darted past the cabbie who said he had enough trouble in his life and ran up the front steps and into the house where in the light of a single overturned lamp in the bedroom, I found my client face down in a widening pool of his own blood. I started for the rest of the rooms, but then the sound of a motor roaring out of the alley behind the house told me I was wasting my time. When I returned to the bedroom, one glance at Hummel's still form said that the man who had been afraid for his life only 30 minutes ago was already very dead. Next to his body was the 45 he never got to use, and alongside of that, the miniature crystal ball splattered with blood. But it killed him. There was a key which I found fit the front door, lying in the middle of the carpet. The drawers and closets were all open, as well as his half-packed suitcase. It's a good time to call the police. Homicide, Detective Lieutenant Matthews speaking. Marlow, Lieutenant, I'm at 4100 Fountain, and standing next to a man named Mark Hummel, who used to be a client. He's dead, Matthews, murdered. Oh, any idea who did it, Phil? Well, I got an idea. It might be a lot of muscle called Bonnie Kovac, who works in a garage on Santa Monica Boulevard. You sure it wasn't a robbery killing? No. Well, you know, we've had a lot of second storage jobs there, about every three weeks in that neighborhood. Well, I'm not sure of anything yet, but you see, I was high... Uh-oh, company, Lieutenant. I'll catch up to you later. Mark, I... Oh, I beg your pardon. Is, is Mr. Hummel in? Yes and no. Did he expect you? Well, no, he didn't. Who are you? Philip Marlowe. Well, is Mark in or not? Yes, he's in. You'll find him in here, if you insist. Oh, thank you. I I'm sorry I bit your head off, but what I have to... Oh, no. He's dead? Shot with that? No, no, it's his own gun. He was beaten to death with that glass ball there. Oh. That key is his, too. It fits the front door. I already tried it, and then I put it back when I found it, since the police appreciate neatness on the scene. But that I... doesn't make sense. Mark always carried his keys in a leather case. Oh. It should be right there in his right pocket. Yeah. Hey, you're right. House key with a bunch of others, and, uh... Yeah, this one matches the one on the floor. How'd you know about this? Oh, I I'm an old friend of Mark's, Mark. You'd have to be. What were you in such a hurry to tell him? I, I don't remember. Maybe I can help you. Maybe it was a little message you were going to deliver from Bonnie Kovac. I don't know anyone by that name. And since that leaves us with very little in common, Marlowe, I think I'll leave with only this forty-five here for companionship. Oh, fine. Now, get over there against the wall and turn your back. Well, go on. Now what? And don't move until you hear me drive away. Or your health will suddenly be very, very poor. Good night. When Little Red Riding Hood slammed out of the place, I knew I could either follow her or wait for Matthews to siren up to the front door and then tell all. One last look around the room, including the key in the middle of the carpet, made me change my mind again. If the key could be traced, it might be a definite link to Kovac, so I headed for Hippo Link's garage on Santa Monica Boulevard in the hope of further information about a hot-tempered man who worked there. 
Five minutes later, I was walking down a cement ramp that dropped from the street level into an acre of underground parking space filled with a crowd of heavy with chromium cars that belonged to the fashionable neighborhood nearby. Hippo himself was a perspiring oval, approximately 5'8", measured in any direction, with tiny eyes, tiny nose, and a dozen chins that danced when he laughed, which seemed to be always... He was standing next to a pickup truck marked Ace Battery Shop, oh, why talking to the driver. Forget, huh? And because of that, you want more money for him, huh? <laughs> that, I suppose, is easy to get. Now, look, Hippo. Listen, I... Plume, I won't pay anymore. My overhead's too high already. So if you can't get them for me at the same price, forget the whole deal. Besides, I don't like the way you do business anyhow. Meaning what, Hippo? Meaning that when I give you an order, Plume, I want it delivered to me in person, not to just any flunky that's standing around. Okay, okay. That was a slip. It won't happen again. Yeah, not twice, it won't. <laughs> Goodbye, Plume. I got customers. Hey, can I help you, mister? Maybe. I'm looking for Barney Kovac. Is he around? Uh, no. Why? What do you want him for? Maybe murder. What? Barney, he killed someone? Yeah. Wait a minute. Plume, I said goodbye. Go on, beat it. Okay, okay, Hippo. I'll see you around. Let's, let's go in the office here, Mr. A little quieter. Yeah. Sit down. Hi. You a cop? No, private detective. Name's Marlowe, Hippo. Marlowe, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> never heard of you. You know, but then uh, I, I never heard of a lot of people, huh? <laughs> mm, that's right, Hippo. People like, for instance, Mark Hummel. <laughs> Uh, why him, Marlowe? He was the one Kovac killed. Well, 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 what do you know? Doesn't seem to break you up. Why should it? Hummel was a louse, Marlowe. Everybody said so. Of course, I didn't know him personally, except to joke with him when he brought his car in. You know, a little laugh goes a long way with some guys. Eh? Mm. <laughs> Tell me, Hippo, did you know that Hummel was going out of town? Yeah, he told me this afternoon. <laughs> Should have gone yesterday, huh? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you don't like jokes. I no. can play it straight. What do you want? For an open of this. But tall blonde with brown eyes and a pretty face who knows how to handle a forty-five as well as conversation walked in here. Would you know her? Am I? Could be Rhonda Beaumont, Barney's girl. She lives in a plush apartment over at 38 Sweetshirt Drive, just above the strip. How does she figure? Probably great in a Catalina swimsuit, but in this deal, I'm not sure. She might have put me on the right track by setting me straight about a key to Hummel's apartment that I found next to his body. Wasn't his. A key? Hmm. Yeah, the design on it near the top, the round part was like a fancy figure eight. Mean anything to you? Not being a locksmith, no. <laughs> anything else? Yeah. Where can I find Barney Kovac? How would I know? He quit at five today, just like he does every day. And I quit at nine, Marlowe, which happens to be right now. So, goodbye, mister. Just like that? Yeah, just like that. You see, if I work late, Marlo, I got to pay myself overtime. <laughs> that hurts because I can't afford it. <laughs> see what I mean, boy? <laughs> out on the street and behind the wheel of my car before I saw the man in the back seat who had a snub-nosed 38 leveled at my hairline. He looked rugged enough to be no one else but Barney Kovac. Drive, Marlow. Straight to the corner of Melrose and Orange Drive. I live over a store there, and it's quiet, so we can talk without being disturbed. Come on, drive! <laughs> Right ahead of you, Marlo. One with a closed transom. Keep walking. And when I get there? Then you'll go inside, sit down, and rest while you listen. To what? To the truth, Marlo. I've been following you long enough tonight to know that you're off your rocker. You see, fella, I didn't kill Hummel. Yeah, I know. He's double-jointed. It was suicide. Slugged himself from behind. All right, cut it. Yeah, here's a key. Open up. Okay. Hey, you made a mistake, Kovac. Wrong key. What are you talking about? Let me see that. Sure. With pleasure! Stupid. <laughs> now that I got your gun, bud, try it yourself. Come on, Kovac. Close quarters make me nervous. You're making a mistake, Marlowe. Yeah, yeah, sure I am. The guys who are off their rocker always do, remember? Now get over there in that chair and behave while I use your phone. Marlowe, don't move or I'll kill you. Hippo. Barney, take the gentleman's gun. It's heavy for him. Mm, sure. Here, now here, boy. Here's some money. Get clear of L.A. till this thing's all cleaned up. You're in a bad spot. I know, but I didn't kill Hummel, Hippo. You gotta believe me. Yeah, by all means. Barney, my boy, if you say it, I believe it. 
But others won't be that accommodating, I'm sure, so go on. And no matter what you do, don't worry about Marlowe. Huh? Nah, he won't be following you. <laughs> you can count on that, Barney. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, programs on a summer Sunday afternoon come to you at home, in your cars, on the beaches, and 101 other places where you are at ease. And for your leisure time listening, what is better than music? Every Sunday afternoon, CBS brings you two outstanding programs of music. Gems from the great composers played by the Symphonette. And the sweet, memorable songs of the outstanding modern composers and semi-classicists sung by the Choral Ears. Each program is designed especially for fine summer Sunday afternoon listening. Hear both the Symphonette and the Carl Ears tomorrow afternoon on most of these same CBS network stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Key Man. thick, fat fists of Hippo looked like a toy as he leveled it at my chest while Kovac got away. And the fat boy kicked the door shut, leaned his ponderous 300 pounds against it, and smiled. The smile faded gradually and finally died, but the muzzle of the gun in his hand didn't so much as twitch until the battered alarm clock on the dresser had clanked off a monotonous 15 minutes. At that point, Hippo Link leaved his face up into another smile, waddled across the room, and laid the gun down on the table in front of me. Okay, Marlo, you behaved yourself real nice. Barney's got all the head start he'll need, so you can leave now. You know something, Link? You're not only fat between the sleeves, you're overweight between the ears, too. Helping a suspect escape doesn't sit well at headquarters. Now, now just a minute, boy. You're kind of jumping to conclusions, aren't you? You were putting the muscle on a friend of mine, and I helped him out. That's all that happened so far. So <laughs> you look a little silly running me in on that. But if you still want to try, boy, the... Guns right there on the table. Okay, Hippo, you win for now. But don't think I buy that silly one, two, three story of yours. May not be Peck's bad boy, but I don't see you as a Galahad either. <laughs> well, how do you put the story together then? <laughs> I don't know that that's any of your business, and even if I thought it were, I wouldn't tell you. But I'll let you in on this much. I don't know for sure that Kovac is guilty, but then I don't know for sure where you or Kovac's girl Rhonda Beaumont fit either. Mm, I wouldn't know. You said you knew her. So? You seem to think a good deal of that kid, Kovac. So? So couldn't it be possible she paid you to come up here and see that her boyfriend got away? <laughs> like you said, Marla. I don't know that it's any of your business. <laughs> How much cash does it take for you to stick your neck out as far as you have, huh? Or could it be you've got a thing going for Kovac's girl and would be glad to see him out of town? <laughs> Ah, you're kidding, yeah. boy. <laughs> Look, why don't you alone? What's it to you now? My client was knocked off right under my nose, remember? Are you going to let me out of solitary? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Pick up your pistol and run. <laughs> and if you need me for any more help, why, be sure and let me know. Tippo standing in Kovacs flat, and downstairs I stopped in a phone booth long enough to have the latest developments for what they were worth relayed to Lieutenant Matthews. And I drove out to where Sweetser turned straight up into the hills and parked in front of number 38, the Murrow Apartments, a terraced heap of pastel plaster and angled glass in which Rhonda Beaumont had a first floor front. I took a look at the large private view of the city as I crossed the small private patio and knocked on the substantial private entrance. When it cracked open, I helped it along just enough to step inside. Fast! What in the... Marlo! You will come in, won't you, whether you're asked or not? Yes, and it's sweet of you to ask me, Rhonda. Is, um... Is he here? He? Hmm. In a city of four million, half of which are male, that borders on being a stupid question. But the answer is no in any case, because until you strong-armed your way in here, I was alone. I can't buy it. I figure Bonnie's the kind of a boy that would want to take stuff like you right along with him when he leaves. Bonnie leaving? Mm hmm. What are you talking about? He's running away from that mess over on Fountain. He's leaving town. You're lying. I've heard enough uh -uh. from you. Mark. I'll take the handbag, baby. Oh, you. Hmm. Heavy enough to have that cute 45 caliber compact inside, right? Okay, it's in there. Take it. I don't care. 
But look, Marlowe, is that the truth about Barney leaving town? As if you didn't know, yes. And while we're on that subject, why did you show up at Mark Hummel's place tonight? Well, I went there to warn him about Barney. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought you were in love with Kovac. I am. Do I have to draw you a picture? Barney Kovac's strong and reckless, but he was trying hard, awfully hard, to get started for himself, and then... Well, I, I used to go with Mark before I met Barney, and... And because of that, Mark deliberately beat him out of the best deal he'd ever had, the louse. Just to spite me. Well, Barney was furious, and I knew something terrible would happen if they ever got together, so so I went to tell Mark to stay out of his way, that's all. You got there a little too late, is that it? I don't know. Well, at least give me a handkerchief out of my bag, Marlo, darn it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Here, I, uh... am. <laughs> Hey, hey, these keys. Rhonda, this one, the one with the figure eight design. Where'd you get it? Oh, it's my new door key. Yeah, I know, but where'd you get it? I don't know. Barney had it made for me one day while we were having lunch. Who's the guy who made it? I don't know. Where were you eating that day? A Hungarian place on Fairfax near Santa Monica. Well, where are you going, Marlo? Fairfax near Santa Monica. Here's your bag, Rhonda, and if you got any sense, stay put and try real hard not to shoot anybody. At least until I call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Along, baby. Hey, late extra! The world's in terrible shape. It's a mess. Read all about it. Late extra papers. It's all over now. Paper, Mister? No thanks, kid. Tell me something. Where's a locksmith on this block? Locksmith? No, oh, there ain't none. Oh, come on. Sure, there is. A guy who makes keys. It's got to be. Think hard, will you? It's important. Think hard, he says. Look, mister, I know this whole neighborhood like the back of my own hand. No key maker. Uh-huh. Well, how about a guy who's shopping saws, scissors, things like that? Nah. Nothing like that. Mm. We got uh, filling stations, bars, a delicatessen, drugstore, shoemaker, dry goods store, three restaurants. One's Hungarian. That's on Fairfax. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ace Battery Shop there across Ace the street. A toy shop. store on the corner. A lampshade battery joint. Shop. Wait a minute. Hold it. Battery. Ace Battery. Plume. Uh, uh, plume. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Old man Plume owns the joint. Uh. A real sour apple, you know what I mean? Place a dumb, too, but he works hard. He's probably over there right now, working in the back room. Bless you, my boy. Thanks a lot. Yeah, who is it? Customer, my battery's dead. You gotta help me. Now, look, mister, my place is closed up. Come back. Hey, what is it? Sorry, Plume, but tomorrow's a long way off. This is an emergency. Now, take it easy and you'll be okay. I got a job for you, and it's got to be done tonight. Well, listen, I said my place... Shut is... up. Now, get this, Plume. I'm a friend of Hippo Lynx and Bonnie Kovacs, all of which makes you perfect for my job. Now, what kind of a job are you talking about? This. It's a key. Duplicated. A key? Hey, buddy, this is a battery shop. I can't make keys here. In the first place, you got to have a license. I said this was an emergency, didn't I? Get busy. With what? My fingernails? I don't know how to cut keys. Somebody's stringing you, pal, and I... Bloom, keep away from that drawer! Well, 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 well. Whole drawer full of blank keys, huh? And that 38 in the drawer here must be that license you spoke of. Come on, you get up. Wait, wait. Leave, leave me alone. I, I didn't do anything. Now listen, I... Plume. I want one straight answer out of you. Fast. You made a delivery to Link's Garage sometime today, and it wasn't batteries. Who'd you give it to? Come on. I I, I left it with Barney Kovac. He was the only one around, but it was nothing, an envelope. Yeah, full of keys. Thanks very much for your help, Plume, but I'm in a hurry. And just so I'll be sure to see you later. Good night. <laughs> out to my car, piled in, and headed straight out Santa Monica for La Cienega. And when I got within sight of the dark cabinet entrance to Hippo Link's underground storage garage, I slowed down and looked for a phone that I could use to call Matthews and still keep an eye on the garage because the way things stood now, I couldn't afford to miss a lick. But then I got a break. I decided to try a mobile gas station on the corner when the scream of a siren shoved me up against the curb and a squad car swerved out from a side street, ground to a rubber burning stop in front of the garage and disgorged Matthews himself and the driver on the double. I slammed out of my coupe and belted across the street after her. Matthews! Hey, Matthews! Oh, I'll get back! Go this way! We get Kovac corner down inside there. You're just... Now, down. wait a minute, wait a minute. Matthews, you got this deal all wrong. Oh, no, we haven't. I got two out and back. He's trapped. We'll get him No, no, no. Right. Hold everything, Matthews. Listen to me. I'm going down there and talk to hey, him. No, I'll no, be back no. in a minute. Oh, oh, come back here, fool! Kovac! Kovac, this is Marlowe. Come on out. I got all the answers now, Barney. 
I just had a talk with Plume and I got a lot of truth out of him. Come on, Barney, you're not helping anything. Help! Ooh. Oh. 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 Phil. Phil, you all right? That's my shoulder, Matthews. No, I know this. It happened oh. sometime. No, this cover. Oh, no, listen to me. Don't shoot. shoot. Don't. Don't. Look at my arm. Uh, listen, Matthews, Kovac didn't do it. What? The shot that got me came from back there on the other side. Yeah, that's it, Pete. Further back. There. There he is, Matthews. That's the boy. That's the fat guy runs this. That's joint. right. Yeah, Hippo Link. Second lieutenant, he's your killer. Stop, Link. Stop. I got him, Phil. He's down. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one nice thing about Hippo. You can't... You, you can't miss him. Oh, thanks. I, I... I think I'd better sit down a minute. You feeling better now? Oh, great, great. Uh, you can't beat these hospital beds for comfort, Lieutenant. <laughs> I'm getting one for my apartment. You can crank it into 30 different positions, you know that? Yeah, yeah, I know. The doc says you got off with a flesh wound. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're pretty lucky, Phil. You know. <laughs> and I just stopped by to tell you they saved Hippo Link, so he'll have to be tried. There won't be much, though. He's already admitted everything. Well, what about Plume? Did you get anything on uh... him? Still so groggy, hardly knew his own name when we picked him up. Yeah, it was quite a racket they had, Matthews. Yeah, smooth, smooth. Every rich customer come into Hippo's garage, left his house key with his car keys, was a cinch to be burglarized sooner or later. Yeah, Plume cuts a duplicate key, they find out when the people are away, and that's all they need. Some set up. The show backfired on him tonight. Hummel went to a lot of trouble to tell Hippo that he was leaving town at seven just to throw Bonnie off his trail. But Hippo took it as a great opening for his racket. So Hummel came home right in the middle of the burglary, and Hippo had to kill him to get out of the way. That's it? Oh, uh, by the way, hmm? the friend of yours, Bobby. Oh? Yeah. I'll get him. Come on in, Barney. He's feeling fine. Oh, swell. Hi, Mr. Marlowe. Hi. I guess Rhonda and I owe you quite a vote of thanks. You owe me nothing but an explanation, Kovac. Why'd you run? Well, I don't know. Half the way I shot my mouth off about Hummel, I figured I was hooked for sure when he turned up dead. Once I started running, I couldn't stop. Kept getting worse. Yeah, it's exactly what Hippo figured. Yeah, that's one I don't get, Marlo. Why did he help me in the first place? He had to, brother. Hippo knew that my best clue was an extra door key. He also knew that Plume had left a bunch of keys with you to give to him. He was sure that if we ever got together and talked about keys, he'd be stuck. Yeah. But as it turned out, I got the same lead anyway from the key Plume made for Rhonda. Uh, hey, Matthews. Yeah? Crank me up in the middle, will you? Uh, what, like this, Phil? Oh, yeah, 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 that, that, that's perfect. <laughs> Barney, turn off that reading lamp, will you please? Sure. Yeah, anything else, Marlo? Uh, yeah, yeah. You see that no visitor sign there? Yeah. Well, just hang it on the door on your way out. <laughs> I'm here for three days, fellas. I'm gonna make the best of them. Good night, all. <laughs> left, I nestled down to the solid comfort of clean sheets and quiet darkness. And my eyes were almost closed when it happened. The light snapped on. A pair of efficient hands grabbed me, stabbed an inch of hypodermic needle into my right arm, jammed a cold, hard thermometer under my tongue and splashed a half a pint of icy alcohol on my back. Oh, it was awful. But when it was over, she looked back from the door and smiled before she went out. A red-headed nurse and very pretty. <laughs> Only then did I notice the set of keys she'd forgotten on my medicine table. One was thick with a figure-eight design. It was her door key. And for just a moment, I wondered foolishly if I could get a hold of Mr. Plume again somewhere. For just a few minutes. <laughs> ah, cut it out, Marlow. Go to sleep. <laughs> Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman McDonnell. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Parley Bear, Jack Moyles, Howard McNear, Shep Menken, and Don Oreck. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is written by Richard O'Rant. 
Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was going to be a vacation in the wide open spaces, but a black stallion, a tiny emerald, and a battered horseshoe meant a 24-hour delay. It could have been worse, because to the dude from Manhattan, they meant death. Most of us think we are free of tuberculosis, yet how many of us make sure with periodic chest x-rays that we have no symptoms of this dread disease? Anyone can have TB without being aware of it. In the early stages, there are often no signs, and yet it is in this early stage when it is most important for the disease to be detected. So remember, TB can be cured if you catch it in time. Make an appointment for that chest x-ray immediately. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. This time it was going to be a vacation in the wide open spaces. But a black stallion, a tiny emerald, and a battered horseshoe met a 24-hour delay. It could have been worse. Because to the dude from Manhattan, they meant death. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy. As we present... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Dude from Manhattan. Every so often, life in the city seems to boil down to nothing but noise and concrete. Where all a deep breath does for you is to pack more exhaust fumes into your lungs. And the nearest thing to nature is a mangy sparrow pecking survival out of a dirty alley. So when I got a long-distance call from an old friend inviting me to spend a week in the great outdoors at a ranch he just bought near Rattlesnake Mountain, <laughs> I snapped at the chance. Inside an hour, I was rolling down the highway toward San Bernardino. And 120 miles later, at 5 o'clock, I turned in under a big arch of gnarled cedar that spelled out Rainbow Ranch. But the layout beyond was about as primitive as a dry martini. A ranch house the size of Union Station was backed up by blue tile swimming pool, paved tennis court, and a semicircle of bungalows with all the rustic charm of a Hollywood motel. I drove on in slowly as a broad-brimmed hat, red gabardine shirt, hickok belt, and hand-tooled boots bounced out the door and ran toward me. It was my host, the ex-hotel man, Harold R. Lost. Oh, rascal. How are you, boy? I am sure glad you can make it. Go on out, and I'll show you around. Hey, what is all this, Harold? <laughs> From your phone call, I expected a shack with oil lamps, a wood stove, and at least a few head of cattle. Oh, you mean I didn't tell you? Why, this is a guest ranch, Phil. Guest ranch. The best in the West. Oh, brother. <laughs> oh, and incidentally, don't call me Harold. No, huh? Bad atmosphere for the dudes. The name's Buck now. Buck Lawson. Buck? <laughs> oh, 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 no. Oh, I got real spread here, Phil. Real spread. Fourteen big cabins, string of thirty horses, stables down there. Oh, there Buck. Oh, hello, Buck. Beautiful day, isn't it? Howdy, folks. Sure is. <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Doberman. He's a big fan of storage man in L.A. No. As I was saying, I... Thunder! Who's coming? Red Rider? Uh, not funny, Phil. Not funny. Look, it's Thunder. Oh, that black devil. He's loose again. That horse will kick the fence down of those fools. Don't hold him. Hey, hey, that's some animal. He's a beauty. Yes, and a renegade. A skittish, temperamental bronco with anybody but Virgil Sawyer. Yeah? Oh, they got a rope on him now. That'll hold him, huh? Yeah, not for long. Sawyer's the only hand I've got who can get close to that stallion. And he's leaving tomorrow. Blast it. How come? Well... Frankly, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah, I, I, wait a minute. I came up here for a rest, not a job. I know, I know. You'll get it, Phil. You'll get it. But uh, since you're here, I figure you could sort of keep your eyes open for me. Lawson, it's a dirty trick. No, 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 Phil, please. I'm expecting trouble, and bluntly, I can't afford it. Mm. Every cent I've got is tied up in this ranch. A serious scandal could ruin me. And you're just the one who can keep that sort of okay, thing Okay, okay. So it's the old hotel business on horseback. How does this Sawyer mean trouble? Well... 
there's a couple here from the East, the Mortons. He's a top silk wholesaler from New York and rich. Oh. And that kind means everything to me, Phil. But his wife, Judy, an ex-dance instructor with Arthur Murray back East, is... Well, she's bored stiff out here. And the upshot of it all is that somehow... Mm -hmm. Somehow she and your cowboy Sawyer started making eyes at each other and the husband got nasty about it, huh? How did you know that? Yeah, well, it's standard, like a B-picture plot. Well, anyway, they came to blows this morning. Maybe Virgil's innocent, maybe not, but I can't take a chance, so I fired him. Ordered him to pack and get off the place by tomorrow. Well, that's that. What are you worried about? Plenty. Sawyer's a proud man, Marlo. He, he was furious. He threatened to get even. I'm not sure he means it, but if he does, well, that's what we have to look out for. The we, huh? Now, look, Buck, you built me into coming up here, and I got a good notion to turn wait, around... Wait, wait, wait. Hold it, Phil. What's the matter? You see that couple going into cabin number eight? Yeah. That's the couple I'm talking about. The Mortons, Paul and Judy. Cabin eight, huh? They don't tell me. Just let me guess. Yeah. Yeah. You're right, Phil. You've got number seven. Mm. Okay. Yeah, sure. Number seven it is. I'll be seeing you, Buck. <laughs> up to number seven and waited for the boy to show up with my bag. Then I started to unpack, but stopped when I heard a riot next door. At that point, sprawling Rainbow Ranch was just a horizontal tenement. Nothing more. Well, let me point out a few... Now what are you doing? Shutting the window. Isn't it bad enough to make a fool of yourself in private? You have to make a public scene as well? The voices rattled on for a few minutes, then dwindled off into a long and golden silence that said maybe a peace treaty had been signed. But then a door slammed to number eight, so I peeked out. It was Morton. And from the look on his face, I knew the peace treaty was nothing but an armed truce. I followed him to the big lodge and into the bar, and when he sat down, I took the stool next to him. Well, uh, what'll it be, gentlemen? Scotch and water, no ice. Uh, the same, with ice. Well, Mr. Morton, I guess that brands us as dudes, huh? <laughs> Bourbon's the only drink out west. I wouldn't know, I'm sure. Oh, it's a fact. Uh, hey, that's a handsome ring you got there. And the initials are the same as mine. Those stones are emeralds, aren't they? That's right. Yeah. There's supposed to be four of them. One's missing, I see. Is that an emerald, too? It was. Happens to be my birthstone. Oh, here you are, gentlemen. Oh, fine. Allow me, Mr. Morton. There you are. Oh, thank you, sir. How'd you lose it? Stone, I mean. I don't know. It happened several months ago, and in any case, it's no concern of yours. Now, if you don't mind, I'd just as soon be left alone. Oh, well, that's too bad. Here I was hoping I'd find out all about the silk business. The silk what do you mean by that? Oh, just conversation. You are in that business, aren't you? Of course, but... Hey, who are you, anyway? Name's Marlowe. And just why are you prying into my personal affairs, Mr. Marlowe? Because I got a little free advice for you. Cool off before you start the kind of fire you can't put out, huh? So that's it. That cowboy saw you. Mm -hmm. Marlowe, now you're getting too personal. I suggest that you mind your own business. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to lose my temper that way. Good night. Yeah, it's bound to be. Charming, isn't he? Well, Mrs. Morton, where'd you come from? I was standing over there watching. My husband has all the social grace of a tarantula. Well, maybe you should have looked closer before you made the leap. Oh, that's the wonderful thing about him. Yeah? You're not apt to like Paul much when you first meet him. But once you get to know him, you hate him. Yeah, I'm not sure that's funny. It's not supposed to be. I've been living with him for six months now. So jealous, it's unbelievable. He wouldn't leave me in New York, oh no. Insisted on dragging me out to this, this dust bowl with running water. Why a ranch, I'll never understand. He doesn't know one end of a horse from another. Well, with his aptitude, he'll learn. <laughs> you know, it might be, he figured you two might get back together if you had a chance to relax in the open, Mrs. Morton. Mm-hmm, uh -huh. so he said. However, we weren't here ten minutes before he accused me of getting romantic with that leather-faced cowboy. Does that make sense? I don't know. Both gentlemen are justified. You're lovely to look at. Somebody ought to remind my husband. <laughs> his idea of welding a marriage is to spend all his time playing gin with that Doverman. Who? Doverman, the van and storage character from Los Angeles. Oh. Which, of course, leaves me saddled with his wife, Carrie. Now, there's a cute personality for you if you happen to like neurotic parrots. So what with the desert, the dame, and gin rummy? Virgil began to look pretty good, is that it? Excuse me, folks. Uh, care to order another drink before yes, dinner? Yes, I would. And I'd like it over there, alone. Make it Manhattan, bartender. Strictly Manhattan. And make it double. Mr. Marlowe, good night. Hmm. No, I'm not so sure. It 
was almost dark when I left the bar and headed down to the bunkhouse where the working personnel of Rainbow Ranch called home. The casual clutter of rumpled cots, scattered pulp fiction, and dusty boots gave it the only sign of authenticity I'd seen in the entire place. But aside from that, it was empty. Then a noise from outside brought me around the building to the back, where I ran up against six and a half lean feet of solitary cowboy, with his hat shoved back on his head, pitching horseshoes. <laughs> he was out of uniform for a flashy dude wrangler, which left him in a faded blue shirt and Levi's that fitted his lanky legs like a pair of bent stovepipes. He spotted me and stood there swinging a battered horseshoe in each hand while I walked up to him. Hello? Hiya, Sawyer. A little dark for horseshoes, isn't it? A little. Hey, hey, you're good. <laughs> good at horses, too, huh? I understand you're the only man who can handle that black stallion, Thunder. Yeah. What's the secret? No secret. Just have to treat him right. What's on your mind, mister? fact that you're leaving tomorrow. I reckon you better keep out of my business. Uh, now look, Sawyer, it takes at least two to make a fight. And fights are poison to Buck Lawson. So? I don't like to see my friends poisoned. Now, uh, why don't you take it easy, huh? Lay off. Keep your nose clean. I don't know who you are, mister, but I'll tell you this anyway, seeing as you're so interested. I'm leaving here tomorrow, all right. And I'm gonna square up with a couple of folks first before I go. I got a raw deal here, and I'm just not the kind to take it laying down. What do you mean, raw deal? You're a big boy now. You ought to know better than to get yourself all involved. I'm not much for conversation, fella, but I'm going to say something real plain so you'll be sure to sell me. Oh! By the time I got myself untangled and back on my feet, the strong, silent fugitive from the old Chisholm Trail was gone. However, my original theory that it takes two to make a fight was still valid. So I decided to find Paul Morton and spend the rest of the evening close to him. His cabin was dark, but I remembered the running gin game he had with a big van and storage man. So I went down the line to the Doverman cabin and knocked. It was Carrie, the perennial dude, who galloped up to open the door. Howdy, stranger. Come on in and set a spell. Our latch is always stringing out. Well, I sure do thank you, ma'am. My name's Marlowe. Orville, this is Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Howdy, Marlowe. Howdy. Hope you'll excuse the looks of the place. Our box of extra clothes just arrived from town. Carrie's been unpacking it. Sit down there, Mr. Marlowe. They're mostly old things. Just throw them on the floor. Oh, thanks. But really, I can't stay. I'm looking for Paul Morton. I thought I might find him here. Morton, say. Hey, there's a nice chap. Met, met him day before yesterday for the first time and won $90 off him in gin already. Haven't seen him tonight, though. Orville was out looking for him himself just a few minutes ago, weren't you, dear? Why, oh, yes, as a matter of fact, I was. You didn't locate him, huh? No, I didn't. You know, he seemed to be all upset this afternoon. Couldn't keep his mind on the game. I thought I'd have a little chat with him to calm him down, so. Orville's a whiz at that, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, no, it's not me, Carrie. It's this country. I don't see how a man and can keep trouble in his mind on a place like this ranch, Marlow. Yeah, it can happen, believe me. Poppycock, why, son, there's something about this open land round here that cleans out a man's head and his heart, too. You sound like a travelogue. I mean it. A few more days of this and mortal forget there ever was such a thing as a cash register. Yes, sir, give this untamed countryside a chance and it'll cure anything. Oh. Yes, well. Oh, no, come here, come here. What was that? Wasn't the call of the wild, Mr. Doverman. Lawson, what's the matter? Bill, come on, down to the stable, hurry. Something terrible's happened. <laughs> How'd you find out about it, Lawson? One of the boys told me. Heard Thunder raising a terrible fuss. Come over to check, but by then it was all over. Mm. Give me the lantern, Harold, will you? Here you are, here you are. Holy smoke. It's Paul Morton, all right. He's been trampled to death. Oh, it's a ghastly accident. And it's all my fault, Phil. I, I knew Thunder was dangerous, and I didn't get rid of it. All right, take it easy, take it easy. Well, there's I... a lot of questions to be answered before anybody takes the... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look at this. Here by the gate. What's it to hold you? Stables are full of them, Phil. Yeah, not like this one. Look at it, it's all battered up. Well, all right, it's battered. Well, what's that supposed to mean? Nothing yet. But it gives me an idea. Because the last time I saw one of these was being pitched at nine stake behind the bunkhouse. What are you getting at? Well, the chances are at least 50-50 that Paul Morton's death was no accident. It was murder. <laughs> Just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, 
perfect musical settings for a Sunday before the 4th will be yours tomorrow afternoon. The symphonette, a half hour of fine orchestral music, and the choral airs, a half hour of brilliant vocal music, are regular Sunday afternoon features on most of these same CBS network stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Dude from Manhattan. Paul Morton's death, something worse than an accident. Lawson's mouth fell open and the muscles in his face jerked as his eyes moved slowly from me out to the now quiet black stallion in the corral who somehow or other seemed to sense the death at our feet. Then as the trembling man's lips silently formed the word murder, he gestured for me to help him carry Morton's body out of the stable. After that, he looked at the dead man's broken face once more, said he was going to call the sheriff's office and hurried away. A minute later, Judy Morton stepped into the small circle of light that surrounded what only a short time ago had been her husband except for a thin line of perspiration above her lips. She was no different than when I'd seen her last. I just passed Buck on my way down here. He told me my husband was dead. Did you tell you anything else, Judy? About how Paul died, I mean? No. It was a stallion, wasn't it? An accident? I doubt it. Why, Marlo? For one thing, this horseshoe, too close to the body. But this is a stable. And this is a horseshoe that's been used exclusively for pitching at a stake in the ground. Here, look at it. And remember, Cowboy Virgil's favorite sport is horseshoes. Besides, what reason would your husband have for coming down here at this hour in the first place? He wasn't too crazy about horses, you know. No, but he was about me. Let's move a little away from here, Marlo. Cigarette? No, thanks. I'm not coming apart at the seams because it isn't in me. I hated Paul. Hated him with all my heart, Marlo. I'm down here only because he pleaded with me, begged me to talk to him once more to listen to reason. About what? About the decision I came to less than an hour ago, which was divorce, unconditionally. I thought you said you came out here to try to patch things up. I did. But I also said that we weren't doing a very good job of it. Then, tonight, a little after we left you with the bar, Marlow, I got my hands on the lever I needed to pry myself loose from that jealous maniac. It was the knowledge, Marlow, that my late husband was crooked. Silk business? Yes. While he was drinking his dinner, I went to one of his suitcases for an aspirin. Found what instead? At least three dozen samples of the best silks made without any importer's or manufacturer's name. And underneath that, $200,000 in cash. I know enough about the silk business to fill in the blanks, Marlowe. Hmm. All of which comes under the heading black market, huh? Yes. I added what I had found to the fact that this dude ranch he had insisted on was close to Los Angeles. Close enough for him to run off and conduct his purchasing while I thought he was communing with nature or playing gin with that Mr. Doberman. Then I had him. Mm-hmm. You also had a divorce. No strings attached, right? Exactly. Blackmail to get rid of your own husband. <laughs> Pretty, isn't it? Yeah. Well, at least with this... This accident or whatever it is, it's no longer necessary. No. No, Judy, only two things are necessary. One, the location of Virgil Sawyer, and the other, you and your own cabin, where I can ask you some questions later. Why do you want to ask me questions? Well, I might be making a big mistake, baby. But it might be that Virgil and you are out for the 200,000 bucks. You know, honey, that man in the saddle might like money, too. I'll see you. When I started back for the bunkhouse, the only place I knew of that might give me a lead on the strong, silent horseshoe pitcher, I realized that tagging Paul Morton's death on murder was one thing. Proving it was going to be quite another. And when I was there and the place was empty without even signs of a hasty departure, I was sure of it. But not by intuition, as was the gentleman standing in the open doorway watching my every move. Orville Doverman, champion of the wide open spaces, didn't believe that a clean-cut cowboy could be guilty of anything more unrefined than spitting on a pot-bellied stove. Well, oh, I think you're crazy. Buck told me about your finding that horseshoe next to Morton's body and the conclusion you jumped to from there. You're being very hasty, boy, and that's dangerous, and that's the reason I'm here. I don't believe in necktie parties. Neck a man's got a right to hey, a fair trial. Hey, hold it. Nobody said anything about lynching your hero. Huh? I want to find Sawyer, so that if I'm right, we can save the state the time and trouble of a manhunt. But since you brought it up, vigilante, don't scramble for conclusions too quickly yourself. I happen to have a little more to go on than the relative position of a horseshoe. Not that idle gossip that's going around. The same. But at the moment, it figures two ways. Virgil's unhappy enough for the status quo to liquidate the city slicker. Or Virgil and the squaw light out after a clean start the hard way. Choose one. Nonsense, Marlowe. In either case, and especially the stupid suggestion that the girl and Virgil Sawyer are in cahoots. That I can't believe. Well, for sentimental reasons, I can't either. Besides, Judy Morton found out enough about her husband within the last hour to make murder for freedom's sake very unnecessary. 
She learned he was a crook, Mr. D., if you can stand the disillusionment. Oh, no, no. Yes, and shady dealings in silk. Judy didn't go into details about it, but I gather she found out enough to make him sit up and take notice. And that brings us right back to Virgil. Boots, saddle, and all. Yeah. It does, sort of. And we'll argue the fine points later. But right well, now, Mr. Doverman, if you want to make sure that everybody gets a square deal, get close to Judy's cabin and stay there. Sentry duty, your object. Oh, all right. And if I'm wrong about the cowboy, you've done nothing worse than waste your time. Goodbye. <laughs> Spent the next 20 minutes talking to cowhands, guests, miscellaneous hired men, any and everybody who might have been able to say he went that away, Virgil Sawyer, with no success. And to make matters worse, when I'd given that up and was on my way back to the lodge to help Lawson wait for the sheriff, I found myself being paged, Howdy. Western style, of course, by no one else but oh, Mrs. Gary Howdy. Doverman, the capital D in Dude Ranch. Howdy. Howdy, ma'am. Oh, Miss Marlowe. Yeah. Miss Marlowe, look at this. Look at what I found. I've struck it rich, you might say, much like the old rustlers. The old uh, rustlers, Mrs. Doveman, stole cattle. Oh? Yes. Oh, yes, so they did. I, I guess I meant those panhandle men. Mm. You know, gold is where you find it. <laughs> and anyhow, look, it's a precious stone. Small, but nevertheless precious. Uh, uh, mine while digging for worms, no doubt. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, you're teasing me. Yeah. You know very well that this is a polished stone. Funny thing, though, is where I found it. Shall I tell you? Oh, please. Please do, Mrs. Dover. Well, I was just unpacking those clothes that Orville had sent up from Los Angeles. Yeah. Some slacks and things like that. And, well, when I started to hang a pair up, this fell out of one of the cuffs. And then... <laughs> now, I wonder how a little old emerald like this ever got there. Well, it was probably mice, Mrs. Dover. Em emerald? It... Let me see that, quick. Well, yes, of course. But believe me, Mr. Marlowe, it can't be very valuable, I'm sure. I'm not. What are you talking about? Murder, or a reasonable facsimile thereof, and a girl named Judy Morton, if I don't hurry. Goodbye, and bless you, Mrs. Doverman. You talk too much, but now was the right time. As I ran for Judy's cabin, I didn't know any more about the whys and wherefores of Paul Morton's death than I had before I made small talk with Mrs. Doverman. But I did know that unless Lady Named Luck and I were on the same team, the Rainbow Ranch was due for a second corpse. And when I was close enough to the rough oak door, numbered eight, and Orville Doverman, whom I'd asked to stand guard, was nowhere in sight. The full impact of that responsibility sank into where the wingtips on the butterflies in my stomachs were scratching at my hip pocket. Until I moved in still closer, and there in the light of a single lamp that was halo enough for me, I saw the girl from Manhattan nervously lighting one cigarette from the end of another. But more important, very much alive. I didn't bother knocking. Marlo, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? Honey, I'm uncrossing fingers and toes alike. You know, they've been that way since I realized that I opened my mouth too wide, too soon, which puts you right smack on what used to be known as the spot. Oh, so well, that's the way it happened. Yeah, that's the way it... Now look, Judy, baby, you can't know what I mean yet. It's Doverman, honey, the gin player with all the moving vans. He's the one your husband was buying that black market silk from. I didn't know that until a few minutes ago, which was after I told him where you could be found and that you knew an awful lot. Oh, which Mr. Marlowe, he thanks you and warns you not to move. Yo. See what I mean, Phil? Yo, sure, I see. You know, it's funny, Doverman, when I was outside and didn't see you around, or did see that Judy here was still in good health, I figured that either you had decided to sit tight until you knew exactly how much she did know or that you already started to run. Yeah, this I didn't count on. And this, Marlowe, should point up what I said earlier about your jumping to conclusions. It's dangerous. Handling hot silk is child's play. Huh? It has been for me for 20 years, Marlowe. For your husband, Mrs. Morton, it was much more. That's why I had to come to you like this. That's why I had to know if his stupidity went so far that even you knew of me. You shouldn't have bothered Mr. Doverman. I didn't. No, but you see, Marlowe did. That leaves me even. Uh, correction, Doverman. Paul Morton's dead. You're out in front. I didn't kill Morton, Marlowe, and neither did Virgil Sawyer. I saw it all, my friend. So I can tell you that the man who killed Paul Morton was... Paul Morton himself. Suicide? Are you out of your mind? No, not suicide, Mrs. Morton. Merely a plan for murder that backfired. The intended victim was you, his wife. Oh, no. Keep talking, Doverman. <laughs> Why, Marlowe? I'd rather keep you guessing. I wouldn't. Duck, baby! Oh! My shoulder! Now the man said keep talking. I, 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 I can't. I'm hit. You'll be again if you don't. Sorry, I know. Stay out of this, Marlowe. Come on, Doverman. I'm not going to ask you again. Well, look, I'm not even going to let you fall until you tell the rest. Hey, okay. I'll, I'll tell you. I overheard Morton ask him. Some go to your place first, Sawyer, pick up one of your horseshoes, and then he went to the stables near the Black Stallion's stall. The horseshoe in his hat. 
Oh, I saw you, my shoulder. Come on, Doberman, you're not finished yet. Well, I, I figured that he was going to... Tanaka's wife out, leave Sawyer's horseshoe where it'll be found, then half make it look like an accident that would fool nobody, huh? What went wrong, Doberman? Why didn't it work? Well, he, he approached Thunder from the right side instead of the left. The horse got excited, kicked out, and caught him. That dude. Now, let go, Sawyer. Sure, Doberman. With pleasure. It was a slow but steady two hours of first aid and questions and answers mixed with a San Bernardino deputy sheriff who couldn't quite get over it before Orville Doberman was on his way to a hospital that featured barred windows. Mrs. Doberman, a complete innocent, was on her way back to Los Angeles. And Buck Lawson, Judy, and I were in the bunkhouse. Watching Virgil Sawyer watch a pot full of water boil for coffee. Ranch style. Well, you know, you can't ever tell, Marlo. This whole thing might have just the right effect. Oh. Put the ranch on the map, I mean. After all, it was a genuine 100% cowboy who saved the day for it. (laughs) No, that's not right, Buck. It was Marlo here. I only followed him. Coffee's ready, folks. Oh, yeah, that's good, for me. Good. Let's go. What uh, <laughs> did make you go up there, Mr. Marlow? Oh, a little precious stone, Virgil. An emerald that once fell out of Paul Morton's initial ring. But, Marlow, that happened a long time ago, three, four months. Well, just after Paul had returned to uh, New York from Los Angeles. Yeah, and negotiations with Dovman. You see, honey, it was Mrs. Dovman, really, who found the missing emerald tonight and a pair of slacks that Orville had sent up here. Then that was proof that Paul must have been with Doberman in Los Angeles before. Yet they claim to have met for the first time here at the ranch. Uh, yeah, that's what they claim. That plus what you told me, Judy, made the man with the moving vans it. And, uh, yo, oh, hey, Virgil, that coffee's hot. Uh, but it's good. <laughs> well, anyway, since I told Doverman where you were and that you knew your husband had been dealing in black market silks, he took his cue accordingly. Yes, and fortunately, you, yours. Well, that makes it two people who tried to kill me tonight. My husband and his partner. Seldom is heard a discouraging word Oh, fine And the skies are not cloudy all day Good night, gentlemen Virgil Sawyer made good coffee and lots of it So another hour went by before we finally broke up and I was outside smoking a cigarette and strolling toward my cabin in the start of a vacation that already had been postponed too long. But halfway there, I stopped the sound of raised voices ahead of me. A man and a woman were arguing violently and a little away from them on the porch of my cabin watching the battle of the sexes with consternation while he waited for me was Buck Lawson, mine host. I turned quickly and hurried back to the bunkhouse where I knew Virgil Sawyer would put me up for the night. But I knew that early the next morning, I could sneak off, find a quiet, cool stream, and fish. A coyote high in the hills someplace said I had the right idea. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Charlotte Lawrence, Bill Johnstone, Bill Lally, Herb Butterfield, D.J. Thompson, Lou Krugman, and Jack Carrington. The special music is written by Richard O'Runt. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... I went from a mansion in Bel Air to a cheap flat in Southgate, looking for a girl with a secret, who a man in a pork pie had a wise-cracking secretary and a fat corpse didn't want me to find, but who I found anyway because of the quiet number. <laughs> Three 
highly individual, highly entertaining mystery adventure shows stand high among the top shows on CBS every Sunday. The Green Llama, Call the Police, Sam Spade. Go adventuring with them every Sunday when they come to you over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This one began with a bedlam and got worse as I bumped into a burglar, a bookie, a Boswell, and a body in a big shot named B. And before it was all over, everyone had lost his head because the headless peacock had moved. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Headless Peacock. The day had been eight noisy hours of international complications, local vintage. But it started when a Frenchman from Beverly Hills who spoke no English hired me to find the Filipino houseboy he thought had stolen the family silverware to sell to a prosperous downtown Chinese. However, it had played differently since the Frenchman had been wrong all the way. And both the houseboy and the silverware had turned up in the cool of his own basement, where the servant had gone to do his polishing and comfort. Which was hardly the end of things, because even now, as I slumped behind the desk in my office exhausted, the accused Chinese, who was highly insulted was on hand together with a nasty pet terrier tucked underneath his arm to tell me all about it. And just to top that off, the door was suddenly flung open and Bedlam really set in because the new arrival, who was maybe 28 with green eyes and sparkled in an almost pretty face, was also a redhead with demeanor to match. And it was obvious that one, she wanted to hire me, two, she was in a hurry, and more important, she really... She... uh, Hey! Just a minute! Hold it, both of you. Now, Mr. Tang, I've had enough. Here on your way out, take this. It's the Frenchman's address in Beverly Hills. The mistake was his. See him. Goodbye, sir. Thanks, honey. It was going to be me or that windbag with Terry any minute. What can I do for you? Plenty and all of it in a hurry. Sit down and listen hard, will you, Marlowe? My name is Dennis. Front part, Artie. Oh, which is short for what? The whole thing. It's really Ruth Dennis. R.D., see? Oh, that's cute. R.D., Artie. Yeah, what's the problem? It's a guy I love, Marlowe. He's tall, blonde, and his name is Gordon Holzer, and he sells shoes. But don't mm-hmm. laugh, because when he connects, he does it by the carload. Mm-hmm. Also, I figure he loves me and at the moment is in lots of trouble. Why? Because when I came in on the train late this afternoon, Gordon wasn't on hand with the usual brass band. He wasn't at my apartment either. But a note was. Said he had to work late at the office. I waited an hour and then gave him a ring. They told me he wasn't in, hadn't been for two days. Next, I called his home. There's a bungalow up on Vista Del Mar. 7700 North. Mm-hmm. And when you got no answer, you started to worry, huh? Yeah, so I went up there. Gordon, of course, wasn't around. Somebody else was. Somebody small on the natty side. With no more eyebrows than a goldfish. He belonged to a new sedan, long and black. Did you talk to him? Oh, better than that, we wrestled. You got a cigarette? No. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. It's all right. See, Marlo, this guy was snooping around the place, so I decided to find out a few things. I made believe I had a gun in my pocket, and I told him to put his hands up. Oh, fine. Well, it worked for a while. Which brings us to the wrestling. Though. Yes. When I mentioned Gordon's name, he knocked me down. But he wasn't very big, so I managed to hit him once with my bag before he got away. Also, I ripped his coat pocket open. And here, this fell out. It's a newspaper clipping. A picture of a fat hunk of jewelry that was once stolen from someone named Isaac B. Stolen from Isaac who? B is in B. Oh. Look, it's a peacock with the head broken off. But with a tail that's loaded with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. What does it mean? What is it? Marlo, that's the reason I'm here. I don't know. Mm. You'll turn the clipping over. You'll see that the theft must have happened quite a while ago because the ad on the back features a Christmas special. Tell me, you figure that Gordon stole this from Mr. B? 
Uh, no, I, I don't. Well, then why'd you come to me instead of the police? Well, You what? I... Come on, Artie, let's have it all, huh? Okay. That's better. I don't suppose it's smart not to tell you anyway. Gordon isn't all shoe salesman. He's part lunatic when it comes to the horses. You know, the right pony a day keeps the doctor's bills away. I thought I'd cured him. Now I'm less than sure. So you figured that maybe he got in too deep while you didn't know about it, and now he's trying to even things up by playing with stolen property. Is that it? I hope not. But even if it is, I still want to help him. Now here, here's a hundred dollars, Marl. You go to work for me, yes or no? Yes, on one condition. All right, one. If I find out the facts and pass them on to you, until and if he turns up crooked, and I drop it, agreed? Agreed. <laughs> The lady left, and in that hour that followed, I was on my own in the files of the Hollywood Times. I learned that Isaac B. was a 70-year-old eccentric with curly hair, a bulbous nose, no chin, a million dollars, and a mansion on West Adams Boulevard. He had a Napoleonic complex and was a great philanthropist, as long as the grant in question would perpetuate the name of Isaac B. About the headless peacock, I learned little except that it had never been recovered and that the gems in the tail were of an unusual cut and would be hard to peddle. So it was 8.30 when I finally dropped the oversized bronze knocker monogrammed I.B., after which a man about 40 with a sallow complexion and a voice as delicate as spun glass opened the door halfway. Uh, yes, sir? I'd like to see Mr. Isaac B., please. Name's Marlowe. And your business. Personal. I'm a private detective. And you? Me? Why, I... I'm Everett Ransom. I'm Mr. B.'s biographer, but also, Mr. Marlowe, I act as his aide. Now, if it's about money for some cause, you'll have to follow the usual channels and write to you Mr. Can B. You stop right there, Boswell. I'm not after money, just information. About what? A piece of jewelry that was stolen from Mr. B., a headless peacock. The peacock? You know of its whereabouts. I didn't say that. Now, do I see Mr. B. or no? You, you, young man, open up, Ransom. Bless him either. Yes, sir. We'll sit over here in the foyer. How cozy. Thank you, Ransom. Mr. B., my name is Philip Marlowe. Yes, 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 yes. I heard the private detective, the peacock and all that. Well, what do you have to say? Not very much. I understand the peacock was stolen from you some months ago. Why, huh? yes. Yes, shortly before Christmas. It was one of Mr. B.'s favorites. Priceless is both a museum piece and for the $100,000 worth of we jewels. We all in the know that, Ransom. Yes, sir. Shall I, uh... Shall I go now, sir? No. That busted me for the Young People's Club. I want you to take it with you before you leave tonight. I'll show you the inscription change I want made the first thing in the morning. You can keep it in your apartment until then. Yes, sir. Yes. Now, Marlowe, get to the point. Quickly, please. All right. Mr. B., a client of mine... Whose uh, name is what? Miss Ruth Dennis, if it matters, is worried about a boyfriend. Which concerns the uh, peacock in what way? I don't know. Unless you can tell me something about a natty little man who's short on eyebrows. Eh? Yeah. When last seen, he was carrying a newspaper picture of the bird. Mean anything? No, no, no. Is that all you know about the theft, Miss Marlowe? Just about. That and the name Gordon Holzer and a bungalow on Vista Del Mar near uh, Franklin. Holzer, Holzer, bungalow. What are you talking about, Marlowe? Shots in the dark, Mr. B. Oh, no, shot. When they miss, they miss a mile. Good night, sir. <laughs> Outside in my car as I started away from the curb, I glanced into the rearview mirror and saw the reflection of a sedan that was also just beginning to move. A sedan that was both very long and very black. I kept to the quiet streets and stayed under 30 until I'd gone about two miles, and then, at the next intersection, a busy one, I made my move, which was a sudden spurt as the thick traffic via a wide left turn that produced screeching tires and uh, frank opinions. You stupid jerk! I swung around the block once, made it back onto the quiet street just in time to catch sight of the sedan going by fast. I followed it, and 20 minutes later, when it braked to a stop in Beverly Hills in front of a hat shop marked Lester's, I did the same. I piled out of my car and walked quickly toward what I thought would be the natty man without eyebrows. But when the door of the sedan opened, it was a woman, blonde and beautiful, who ran to the door of the shop, unlocked it, and hurried inside to where a telephone was ringing. There was an alley beside the building, and I ran back to where I could see inside. There were five telephones side by side in a phony front cabinet that spelled Bookie. And on the wall above a publicity picture of a natty man without eyebrows, sitting in the middle of a bunch of zany Why, hats, no, no, Mr. Holdry, beautiful yeah. blonde was talking on one of the all, telephones. Sir. And when Mr. I moved Lester closer, I was happy to hear her address the party at the other end of the line as none other than Gordon Holdry. Uh-huh. He's on his way up there now. Well, where are you? Oh, returning home. That's fine. He's still in the mailbox? Good. 
Of course, Miss Olga, you decided to pay that 15000 for sure this time, haven't you? You know, Mr. Lester wouldn't want you to disappoint him. I moved yet. out of the alley quietly and went back. Entered the shop through the front door, which was still open. Beautiful blonde was just hanging up the phone when I stepped into the light. What? Good evening. Who are you? What do you want here? A new hat. Something chick, chick. Any suggestions? Yeah. Get out of here. This shop is closed for business. Betting included? Bet- What's that? There must be some mistake. This is a hat shop. With five hidden telephones and a boss man who collects pictures of headless peacocks for a hobby? I... Sorry, baby, I don't buy it. Not even as a conversation piece. So shall we start all over again, huh, baby? Well, (laughs) yes. Why don't we? And with this, to keep us from changing the subject. A heavy service 45, honey. Looks a little bulky in that dainty hand, don't you think? It'll look worse when it explodes in your face. Now, who are you? By name, Philip Marlowe. By occupation? A private detective. And just to keep the interview rolling, I sleep in pajamas, tops and bottoms alike. Love Chinese Stay cooking, back. pressed almond don't duck in particular. Closer. And don't, don't prefer blondes. Give me that. <laughs> you big bum. I don't know why I didn't shoot. I do. But lest we lose the question and answer period, your turn. Name. Patience. Oh, no. <laughs> What's the rest of it? Hancock. A very fine Virginia name, Mr. Marlowe. Anything else? Uh, Yeah, there is. What's your connection with Mr. Lester, Gordon Holzer, and the Headless Peacock? If it's any of your concern, I happen to be Mr. Lester's business associate. But believe me, when he gets back from Pasadena, he... (gasps) Oh, I'm... You mean mean just what you said. The man I'm looking for is in Pasadena. Don't look. Thank you, honey child. The interview's now closed because as of this minute, I'm off to the home of the Rose Bowl. Good night, patients. I was going to Pasadena like Patience Hancock was going to join the campfire girls. But as long as the little Virginian wanted it that way, I couldn't see any reason not to play ball. So after I called my client and brought her up to date, blow by blow, I headed for 7700 North Vista Del Mar in what I figured was a business transaction. Headless Peacock included. I parked away from the place which was cedar shingles under healthy ivy and a single lamp at work in the living room. Then I walked up to where I could see that a man, blonde, tall, and alone, and hat, coat, and frightened face was about to leave. When the door opened, I took that as my cue to switch 38 from shoulder holster and announce myself. Well, what do you want with me? Words, Mr. Holzer, lots of them. You see, I work for a... Oh, Mr. Holzer... That man on the floor there behind you, that natty little man without eyebrows. Seems quite still as and shot to death. He is. But I didn't do it. Honest, I didn't. Now, let me out of here. I gotta go. Start running. Come on, Holtz. I'm not all champ. Get back inside. Uh, All right. But I can explain this. Oh, sure. Sure, it's easy. Like one, you lost too much money playing the horses through this dead bookie here who used to double as a milliner. Boy. And two, to square yourself with him, you got mixed up in a hundred thousand bucks worth of headless peacock. And three... Mr. Holzer, as of just now, you had an appointment with said milliner, which body on the floor here says got out of hand. And do you care to add anything? Like how you got the peacock away from Isaac B. and what took you so long getting around to peddling it? I don't know any Isaac B., nor did I... Nor did you what? Outside the window. Somebody's moving. Yeah, somebody with a gun. Duck holds it. It's going to be like... I'm going to shoot! <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Sunday afternoon, a perfect time for music. Sunday afternoon, the time of the week when almost everyone takes time for relaxation. Combine Sunday afternoon with music and relaxation, and you have the Symphonat and the Coral Ears, two outstanding CBS musical programs. Most of these same CBS network stations bring you both programs every Sunday. Relax and enjoy them tomorrow. <laughs> And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Headless Peacock. It had come one, two, three. A corpse on the floor, shots through the window, and Gordon holds her out the back door while bullets made lights out. And Marlowe on the floor, the smart move. It made this the time to call the law, so in case the character with a gun was still hanging around outside, I left the lights off, fumbled my way to the phone, and dialed 116 in the dark. 
minute later, I had Detective Lieutenant Matthews on the wire. So you got a cop, Sam? Uh, hat. Give it to me again, will you? Who, where, and why? A guy named Lester, supposed to be a hat designer in Beverly Hills, but taxed up better as a bookie. He was shot to death here at 7700 Vista Del Mar. What place is that? Uh, one Gordon Holsey. He has his name on the mailbox. Hey, got a motive, Marlow? No, it's a theory. Could be that Lester put on too much pressure trying to collect 15 grand holes or owed him from bad bets on the ponies. There's more, but it'll keep till you get here, Lieutenant. Uh, okay, Marlow. A couple of the boys are on their way now. Mm-hmm. I'll be over myself later. Stick around, will you? Yeah, okay. Goodbye. Marlow, you promised me you wouldn't call in the police, but I heard enough to know you just finished talking to them. Didn't you, you two-faced cheat? You bet I did, cutie. What's more, when you hired I'm me... I'm not I... through. I want to know something else. What are you doing here in the dark, and where is Gordon? All right. In that order, first the lights are out to keep me from being shot in the back. In the second, your boyfriend holds the left on a double because I was about to find out why Lester's body is here on Holzer's living room floor. Lester's body? You heard me. You, you mean that little man is in here? Dead? Very much so. And, and don't burn yourself out on that shock surprise routine. Marlo, I swear I... Okay, turn on a light and show me. Where is this corpse, if any? Baby, don't forget the last time lights were on in here, the room felt like the receding end of a shooting gallery. I didn't see any firing line when I came in. Yeah, that's a point. But there are two ways of looking at it. Will you turn on a light, or will I? Okay, okay, we'll play it your way. Yeah, take a good look. Oh, Marlo, it, it's him all right. Same little man. Artie... You knew I was coming over here. You knew the setup, and I was close to winning an argument with Holzer when somebody broke it up by shooting through that window straight enough not to hit anything, even though Holzer was a perfect target. Add it up for yourself, baby. Oh, it wasn't me, Marlo. Please believe me. You do, don't you? Let's look in this bag of yours first, <laughs> Give honey. Give me that. Yeah, in a minute. Well, oh, that's one thing in your favor. No gun. Could have dropped it in the shrubbery on your way to the door, of course. Here's what I really want anyway. My keys? What do you want them for? I'll tell you later. Well, that's the boys in blue and just in time. Yeah, you louse. In time for what? To hold on to you as a material witness. But uh, I've got work to do, and I want to get it done without you screaming at me all the way. Oh, I wish I'd never hired you. I wish I'd never heard of and you. And another thing, if you're playing me for a patsy kid, that's only the beginning. You'll need a deep well full of wishes before it's over, so come on, behave yourself. told the two prowl car cops no more than I'd already told Lieutenant Matthews, except that Artie should be held because she was Holzer's girl. That plus the small lie that I'd cleared with the lieutenant to leave as soon as help showed, and I was out the door, into my own car, and pointed toward Artie's place, which was on Tamarind. I figured there was a good chance Holzer would head there first, and if I moved fast, I might catch up with him before the police did. Artie's place was dark, which could mean anything out of the circumstances, so I dug in my pocket for the keys I'd taken from a purse and started for a door when footsteps behind me changed my mind. Oh, Marlowe, Mr. Marlowe, say this is a stroke of good luck finding you here. That depends. How'd you manage it, Mr. Ransom? Why, Mr. B has had me trying to locate you since about an hour after your interview this evening. I checked everywhere and finally looked up your client's name in the phone book, got this address, and, uh, well, here you are. Yeah, yes, I know. Why have you been after me? What's all the excitement and make it fast? I'm in a hurry. Uh, yes. You see, your call this evening intrigued Mr. B and me very much, and after you left, we naturally began discussing the theft of the peacock again. Naturally. Look, Ransom, get to some point, will you? I got things to do. Oh, certainly, Mr. Marlowe. Well, sir, the point is that in going over in our minds the days preceding the theft, we both recall a man named Holzer or, or Holter or something very close to that. Mm-hmm. He came to the house one day claiming to represent a certain philanthropy. He, um, he was a fake, of course, and we never saw him again, but it was less than a week later that we discovered the peacock was gone. Stolen. What this man look like, you remember? Well, I most assuredly do. He was bald, about 50 and fat. No, no, it couldn't possibly be the same man. Oh, Oh, you found Mr. Holzer then? Once, briefly, uh, uh, there's no resemblance. Oh, I see. Well, I, I don't know how I'm going to break the news to Mr. B. He's upset all over again. I, I can't tell you how much that headless peacock means to him. Try saying a hundred thousand bucks. Uh, Mr. Marlowe, have you run across anything else tonight other than that newspaper clipping that would seem to be connected with the pin in any way? I, um, I can arrange a reward, you know. No, nothing. I'm sorry. Well, good night, Mr. Ransom. If anything comes up about headless peacocks, I'll call you as soon as... as... What is it? What did you find? A note stuck on the door. Oh, maybe I should... No, no, no. No, I can handle it, really. Dearest Dottie, I didn't realize how fast things got out of hand. I must have lost my mind. 
I'm going to undo all the wrong I've done. And I'm getting out. Love, Gordon. So yes, I should have listened to what's marching on the first time. What? Why, Mr. Marlowe, the fellow sounds desperate. Yeah, he's got a right to. That natty little man I mentioned earlier at night is dead. <gasps> murdered. Oh, great Scott. But, but then, Mr. Marlowe, then how can this man possibly undo all the wrongs he's done, as he says in that note? That beats me. But one thing is sure. This hands my little client a nice clean slate, which makes my next stop the police. I'll see you, Mr. Ransom, and happy peacock hunting. <laughs> I got in my car and drove back the way I'd come to Gordon Holzer's house on Vista Del Mar. The Powell car was gone, but Lieutenant Matthew's sedan was angled in against the curb, the red spotlight still on. I parked and went in. The lieutenant, his hands jammed down in his pocket, stood with two other plain clothes men near the shattered window, while a photographer worked over the corpse on the floor. Artie was nowhere in sight. Matthew spotted me as soon as I walked in and bore down on me with all the frivolity of a heavy cruiser. Marlo, I thought I asked you to stick around. Yeah, yeah, you did. But I got an idea that wouldn't keep. Yeah? Did it prove anything? Not for sure. Where's the girl? Which one? You mean there's more? Oh, yeah. That red-headed fireball, Artie Dennis, you already know about. Yeah. The other one is a southern bell named Patience Hancock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Belonging <laughs> to Lester. Yeah. Caught her snooping around outside trying to find out what had happened to him, and when we gave her the word, she blew her top. Mm. I got both of them locked up. Good. Say, did you get any facts out of patients? Yeah, plenty. Oh? Oh, uh, your bookie theory was right, Marlo. Thank you. Yeah. All we got to do now is find Holzer, wrap this up. Yeah, I'm not sure it's as simple as that, Lieutenant, but it's Marlo. the next step anyway. Come on, let's take a look out back, huh? When he left here, that's the way he ran. I already looked. It's a blank. Oh, really? It's a door that leads out to the alley. Mm. Here, this way. All right. Hey, you see? Nothing. Mm. Must have beat it through here and out to the street. You wouldn't happen to know where... Now, what's the matter, Marla? What are you staring at? Hmm? Oh, that, uh, that window there in the house right across the alley. Yeah. See the one with the lights on and the shade drawn? Oh, yeah. Some old geezer sitting in there. So what about it? The silhouette of his head on the shade, Matthews. Yeah? I won't forget that profile as long as I live. Corduroy hair and a light bulb nose. That is Isaac B. in that room, or... Holy smoke, wait a minute. Hey, what are you doing? Put the gun away! What's the idea? You're crazy? You shot down on the ground. Yeah, yeah, and the old guy in there didn't bat an eye. Didn't even turn his head at the sound. That gives me a big idea, and we're going to check something fast. Come on! We ran back inside, and as I picked up the phone, Matthews found out for me that the house across the alley faced on Common Avenue. Then I dialed Isaac B.'s home number, and when I finally got a sleepy hello, I asked him a question. The answer he gave boosted the odds on my hunch into the sure thing class. When I hung up, Matthews unhappily agreed to play along, and with one of the plain clothes men, went around to Common Avenue to cover the front of the house across the alley. By where I went out to the back way again, 38 in hand, crossed the alley, climbed up on a brick wall, and moved toward the window. It was 18 inches open. I eased one edge of the blind aside and looked in. A life-size bronze bust of Isaac B. I've heard mentioned earlier sat on a table in front of the window. And beyond that was Gordon Holzer backed against the wall and staring in stiff fear at a pistol clenched in the hand of the biographer, Everett oh, Ransom. Minute. Don't shoot. I, I made a mistake, I admit it. You certainly did, Mr. Holzer. A much greater one than you realize. But I want to return this now. I brought the peacock back to you. Don't you understand? Yes. Yes, but I'm afraid you don't. I got careless a few weeks ago and left the shade up one night when I took the peacock out of hiding to admire it. And you watched the whole thing from your dark bedroom window, which is directly across the alley, didn't you? Yes, I, I knew it must be valuable. When I got in the jam yesterday, I broke in here and stole it. But I'm sorry, and that's why I brought it back. And now... And don't move. Don't move, Mr. Holt. You see, two facts must never be revealed. One, that I stole the headless peacock from Isaac B. a year ago. And two, a little matter of murder. You killed Lester? Yes, I killed Lester. I waited for you to come home. And when that Lester showed up and went into your house, I mistook him for you. He was a very nosy little man. I had to kill him. You shot through my window so I could get away from Marlowe. Because you couldn't afford to let me talk to him. In fact, you can't let me talk to anybody. Ever. That's right, Mr. Holt. Luckily, I found out you'd be coming here to my place to return the peacock. Because I was with Marlowe when he found your note to that girl. He knows a lot about this, Marlowe does. But by the time I'm through, neither he nor anyone else will be able to figure out what really oh, look, happened. I'll go away. I'll no. Go. No, Mr. Holzer, it's too late. This way. 
I'll have to restore that gorgeous thing to Mr. B. But I'll be something of a hero for catching the thief and the murderer. I'm sorry, Mr. Holter. But after all, you did bring this on yourself. You're quite a moralist, aren't you, Ransom? Well, how did you... Get back, Holter. Get out of the way. Drop it and wrench your head. Turn loose of the gun. Go, you, Ransom. Come on. Block it. Nice going, Holter. He's out. And I've... I've got his gun, Mom. Yeah. Here it is. I'm going to stand real still. Talk real quietly from now on out. Good enough, Mom? Not quite, but it'll help. From what I've seen of Artie Dennis, brother, you're going to be a lifer anyway, but not with the state. Hey, hey, it's cold out here. Come on, give me a hand. Thanks for getting me out of the pokey, Mr. Marlowe. You rat. No, I figure it's safe to turn you loose now, Artie. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gordon's going to have to stay in here a while, I guess. That's right. But that won't be so bad. At least he'll be where no horses or women can bother him. So I can get to him again. Won't be for long. He's got a lot in his favor, you know. I hope so. I still don't understand how it all worked out. I was in jail, remember? Hmm. How did you pay Grantham? Well, I saw the profile of Isaac B. on a window blind. Didn't move even when I fired a shot. That convinced me that it was a bust of the old boy. So I called him up at his home, and he told me that Ransom had a house on Common Avenue, which put it right across the alley from Holder's. From there, it all fit. Hmm. Well, why didn't Ransom kill Gordon when he fired those shots through the window? Oh, that. He still hoped to recover the peacock for himself at that point. But he didn't know where Gordon had put it, so he couldn't afford to kill him right then. Oh, lovely. <laughs> you know, Marlo, all in all, we're pretty lucky, Gordon and I. Yeah. Try to keep it, will you, baby? Keep it that way on everything but the horses. Oh, you can make book on that, mister. Mm -hmm. Good night, Phil. Good night, baby. I watched her as she walked away. She looked up at the barred windows where a very willing guy was learning a lesson he needed badly. Tossed him an okay with the fingers of one hand. Now, it made me feel good because I was sure she meant it was the kind of a kid who could make it stick. Then I drove home, and all the way I thought about the crazy assortment of people that had become involved because of the ponies and the headless peacock. I was still thinking about it over a glass of milk in my kitchen when I glanced at the newspaper on the table, opened to the sports page. Oh, it was like magic. <laughs> my eye was drawn to a box in the corner and down the morning line for tomorrow's races until it stopped at the name... Lucky Peacock. Oh, it was perfect. A hunch. A hunch that couldn't miss. Lucky Peacock was a sense to win by a head. Or maybe he'd lose by a head. Or maybe he'd... Yeah, well. No use, Marlowe. Tomorrow you go to the races. <laughs> The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joan Banks, Howard McNear, Eve McVeigh, Jack Moyles, and Peter Leed. Lieutenant Detective Matthews was played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is written by Richard Orant and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again when Philip Marlowe says... This time I took a beating and gave one. The man who lived in the dark was afraid. Someone I never got to meet was murdered and a knife-wielding crab was destroyed. All because a girl who hated the water took a boat ride in old Mexico. <laughs> Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time I took a beating and gave one. The man who lived in the dark was afraid. Someone I never got to meet was murdered and a knife-wielding crab was destroyed. All because a girl who hated the water took a boat ride in old Mexico. Mexico. <laughs>
From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's story, Mexican Boat Ride. Clear and clean. You know the kind that knocks ten years off your age and makes you taste the sunshine and your orange juice? It was a day to be spent on an open road to someplace new and exciting. But a phone call I'd received had reduced my open road to Camelita Avenue and nothing more exciting than Beverly Hills. The house I stopped at was one of those you entered through a tunnel of dank, overhanging foliage on a flagstone path grown green with damp moss. A low, thick-walled affair with tiny, barred windows hidden from the sidewalk. I pressed the bell, and a moment later a sallow housekeeper opened the door with what seemed to be a last ounce of strength. She squinted at my card and beckoned me inside. I followed her down a dusky corridor to a heavy, closed door, where she signaled me to wait. The air in the house smelled thick and stale. When she came out again, she held the door open for me and motioned me into a room full of darkness. It became nearly complete when the door clicked shut behind me. All I could see was the vague form of a man in smoked glasses propped up on a bed across the room. There's a chair beside you, Marlowe, if you care to sit. Oh, thanks. I'm Carl Estabrook, importer. You may have heard of me. No, I don't think so. Well, no matter. <laughs> Marlowe, I have a peculiar problem. I want to know why my wife Ona was on a boat day before yesterday off the coast of Mexico. If you could find out... Well, if that's all you got to go on, I doubt it. No, there's a little more. Huh? Ona and I planned to take vacation together. But when I was confined with this illness, we decided she should go on alone. Oh, then your illness is the reason for the midsummer blackout, huh? Yes. If I expose my eyes to light at any time in the next few weeks, the doctors promised me plenty of pain and virtual blindness. Oh. It's temporary, but tedious to mend. That's why I need a capable man with sharp eyes. To look into what, specifically? The paradox of my wife aboard a boat. Mm -hmm. She has a phobia about them. The mere thought of being on a boat makes her panicky. She drove to Ensenada, Mexico, earlier this week, but believe me, her plans did not include boat rides. Well, tell me, how'd you find out she was on one? Did she write? No, she hasn't written me at all, but that's not unusual for her. A friend of mine got back yesterday from a fishing trip down there. The day before, his boat passed another with a girl aboard. He got a good look at her. He was so sure that it was Ona that he hailed her. The girl turned and ran inside. <laughs> it, it bothered him to the extent that when he got home here, he called me to find out if Ona was in Ensenada. Is that all? And that's all. He didn't get the name of the boat. Look, you want me to go all the way down there just to find out if the girl he saw was Mrs. Estabrook? Right. Uh, what is your fee, Marlowe? Fifty bucks a day, plus expenses. That's the minimum, if I take the job. I don't think I will. When business gets so bad, I have to do divorce work, I'll quit and write my memoirs. No, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. No, no, sit down, Marlowe. Ona and I have had our share of difficulties, true. She's quite a few years younger than I, and used to be a dancer. But, generally speaking, we're happy. Specifically what? I'm worried about her. Here. There's money in this envelope and a recent photograph of my wife. And there's more of both if the need arises. Uh, incidentally, what kind of a day is it outside? Gorgeous. Well, then you can drive. It's only 250 miles. Yeah. By the way, how has the importing business been lately, uh, legitimately speaking? You do have a suspicious mind, don't you? Only when the situation calls for it, and this does. However, I can understand an imagination working overtime here in the dark, Mr. Estabrook. So I'll take your money and go on down to Ensenada and see if anything's wrong. But look, I'm giving you notice beforehand. If it turns out to be family laundry and nothing more, I drop it. You're a reputable man. Just see that I get my money's worth, Marlowe, and you can keep the change. I'll expect to hear from you. When 
and my eyes adjusted to the dazzling glare outside. I looked in the envelope and picture of an impish, dark-haired woman and five $100 bills. For the first time, I realized what Estabrook had meant by keep the change. But it didn't help my attitude even a little. By two o'clock, I was on the road south. A late lunch in La Jolla with an old friend, a routine baggage inspection at the border. Then 70 twisting miles of lonely road brought me to Ensenada. Just as the Mexican sun dropped into the sea. I drove past the piers and canneries at the edge of town. And then along the curving shore to the only hotel elegant enough to meet the demands of the woman I figured on Estabrook to be. After I'd gotten a room and cleaned up, I went to the desk and asked for her. She was registered, had number 74, and at the moment was out on the patio. <laughs> All of which sounded ridiculously normal. And I thought again of an imagination at work in a dark room back in L.A. I thanked the clerk in crippled Spanish and turned in time to catch the end of a long, cold stare from a pair of fog-like eyes that bulged out of an otherwise handsome head on a man in a gray gabardine suit. I didn't think my language had been that bad. But when Popeye followed me out onto the patio, I wasn't too sure. There was no mistaking Ona Estabrook. She sat alone at a table in the far corner, a tall, minted gin drink in front of her. So I put on my best tourist-type smile and walked over. Well, Ona Estabrook, this is a pleasure. Enjoying your visit? What? Why, yes, very much, but I, I don't think I... Know me? Oh, of course, you wouldn't remember my name's Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. No, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Marlowe, but you I... You were a to... dancer, weren't you, before your marriage, I mean? Yes, I was a dancer, but you, you'll have to excuse me now. I, I, I'm expecting a friend. I hope oh, you don't mind. Oh, well, just one thing then, Mrs. Estabrook. Would you mind telling me why you were out on a boat day before yesterday? A boat? Mm-hmm. Why do you ask that? Because you hate boats. You have a phobia about them. And yet you were seen aboard one just two days ago. How come? Well, I... Oh, how clumsy of me. Uh, I've spilled the drink all over my skirt. Excuse me. I'll have to change. That maneuver was as subtle as a bulldozer at work. When she spilled her drink, it was done desperately and fear sent her running to the exit. I turned to follow her as she left the lighted patio and headed down a dark arcade. But a gray gabardine suit and a pair of pop eyes slid out of a chair and beat me to it. I waited until their footsteps faded, which said they turned a corner. Then I started after them. It was strictly follow the leader, but I didn't realize how many were playing the game until a knife point stung at the skin at the soft part of the back about kidney high. Stop, senor, and don't cry out. Don't even say ouch. I turned and saw a mottled red face ugly on a squat long arm body. The ivory-handled knife in his hand could have clipped my spine in one easy thrust. You got a car here, senor? Come on, I speak English good. You got a car? Yeah, I got a car. What's it to you? I am Hayaba. The crab, it's latched to me. What's Let's your go. pitch, Buster? Come on, tell me. Uh, Martinez says for me to keep a sharp eye on things, to be sure something is not wrong. It looks to me like something is wrong with you, senor. Who's Martinez? <laughs> you going to play possum, senor? <laughs> uh, this one is your car, huh? All right. Huh? Yeah. Okay. I take first your yeah. one. <clears throat> Uh, now, please to get in. You gonna drive? Believe it or not, you're making a big mistake, Krabby. Besides, what if I don't want to drive? Oh, you better want to drive, gringo. <laughs> or I kill you right here. Go on, drive. Handle <laughs> Stop here. And now we get out. Uh, it's nice and quiet here on the beach, no? Uh, walk over there to that old adobe wall. We're going to have a talk there. It's going to be dull, Buster. We've got nothing in common. Please, senor, don't make it hard on me. I don't know why you got to come and mix everything up again when time is running out. Why did you come? I needed new haraches. Hmm. Look, senor, you think I'm ugly? You know, beauty crab, let's face it. See, si, and I can act even uglier. Maybe I could go on the radio and make a big hit, no? <laughs> or maybe I make the big hit on your face. Oh! Mm, don't try something, senor. Or I kill you with your own gun. Now, the truth. You spoke to the senor about the boat. Why? I forget. Oh. Who are you, senor? A private detective named Marlo. Oh, a private detective? Who are you working for, Dolph Bentley? I never heard of Dolph Bentley. Who's he? You're lying. The senora knows him. 
I heard her say Doc Bentley won't make it tonight. Yeah, he's lucky. See, I tell you something else. He better not make it. Martinez is going to do business with one man only tonight. Now you want to say something? No? Then I'll say it. You take what's going to be left of your face, oh. Bentley, Senor Bentley, until I get out of Ensenada oh. and don't come back. Oh. Understand? Ah. No. Hey. <laughs> Wait a minute. Come on, wake up, wake wait, up. Wait, stop okay. the crap. Come on. Who are you? Wait, oh, it's you. I'll wait, kill you. Wait, 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 wait. Take it easy, will you? You're in good hands now, Marlo. I'm a fellow American. <laughs> oh. You know, you're pretty lucky, you know that? I am? Oh, sure, yeah. Where'd my pal go? Huh? Oh, him? Oh, I chased him off. You know, it's a wonder he didn't put a knife in you. These yeah. fellows are mean with knives. This guy was no slouch with a gun butt, either. Hey. Hmm? Where'd you come from, anyway? Oh, down the beach a ways. I just finished oh. working out on the boat, and I was taking a walk, oh. and I heard the commotion came over to see about it. This guy was beating you up, so I yelled and started for him, but he ran. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm glad somebody stopped him. Thanks very much, Mr. De Roman. Oh. Uh, Lou Roman's my name. Uh, yeah, I'm pleased to meet you, Mono. Thank you know me? Uh, well, yes, I, I took the liberty of looking in your wallet to see that that devil had robbed you. Oh. It doesn't seem so, though. Yeah, I guess I got here just in time. You're a private investigator, I see. Hey, you working on a case now? It's debatable. So far, the case is working on me. Oh. I'd like to find a guy named Dolph Bentley, though. Dolph Bentley? Yeah, yeah. The guy who beat me up had the idea that I was... Ooh. I was hired by Dolph Bentley. Did you ever hear of him? No. No, I come down here every year to fish, too. Uh -huh. Know a lot of folks around here, but I never heard of that one before. Uh, why are you after him? Well, he's he's tied up in some way to the crab who seems to work with another guy named Martinez who, in turn, is going to do some business of some kind tonight with somebody other than Dolph Bentley. I don't know. And it's it's all connected for some screwy reason with a the woman who took a boat ride the day before yesterday. Well, uh, what about that? Uh, the woman being on a boat, I mean. Oh, well, she can't stand boats. She's afraid of... Oh, my head. Oh, uh, wait, wait. Here. here. Thanks. I'm going to get you some first aid right yeah, away. That's a good idea. Holy smoke, my car. Yeah, now relax, huh? relax. It's right over there. Hey, come on, let me help you up. All right, easy oh. now, easy. Ooh. That's it now. I'll drive you. Uh, uh, where are you staying? Uh, at the hotel, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Thanks, good. Roman. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm still busy. Uh, easy, I got you. I, I got to get back there. I got to find that girl, because she's up to her head doing a very nasty mess. Uh, listen, Marlo, huh? if I can help in any way, let me know, will you? <laughs> you know, us Americans have to stick together in a place like this. Right? Yeah, that's it. Come on. Let's go. Oh. Lou Roman, the hail fellow, was indeed well met. He found my gun and drove me back to the hotel. A long hour had gone by since own Estabrook had run from the patio, followed by the pop-eyed character in the gabardine suit. I tried a room, checked with the desk again, and from there spent 30 minutes peering into corners and balconies and getting nothing but indignant glares from Mexican lovers. So I left the building and started through the grounds. I worked my way from the stables up into a secluded garden, deserted by all but a marble statue of Montezuma. For when I passed him, groaned. In the dark at my feet lay Haiba the crab, his mottled face twisted into a tortured grin of agony. And sticking straight up just above his belt buckle was the white ivory handle of his own knife. Crab! Crab, who was it? Who got you? Oh, senor, I, I am sorry what I did. Never mind that. Who did this? Do you know? Oh, si, si. It don't Bentley. Now get a doctor. No, no, you, senor. I uh, tell Martinez that Dolph Bentley is... Crab. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, when you're 65, if you have worked in business or industry, call any office of the Social Security Administration for information about your old age and survivor's insurance. The account number that appears on the Social Security card identifies your wage account. The amount of retirement and family insurance that may be payable is set by this account. Now with our star, Gerald Moore. We return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Mexican Boat Ride. Even as the life trickled out of
the ugly little man called Aiva, and his face, which had been knotted tight in pain, went slowly limp, and he was still. I knew that I'd have to get next to Dolph Bentley before the importance of Ona Estabrook aboard a fishing boat off Ensenada would make any sense. Also, I knew that there was a good chance that said Mr. Bentley and the gentleman in Greg Aberdeen, known to me as Popeyes, were one and the same. So I started back to the hotel. But halfway there, I stopped at the sight of a figure ahead scampering toward an all-alone taxi parked near the main entrance. It was Ona Estabrook. I took off after her. When she was in the cab and away before I could get close enough to do any good. I tried the next best thing, which was the sombrero doorman nearby, who I figured might have heard the address she'd given the driver. Yeah, but what I didn't figure was that the doorman might not habla much English. The Signore Estabrook. Uh, si, senor. Her enters libre a minute ago. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I know that. Now, look. Where did her go? Which way in the libre? Libre. Uh-huh. Oh, un momento, senor. Libre, libre. No, no. No, viene, senor. no look, front. amigo, I, I don't want a taxi. I don't, no libre. No libre. None whatsoever. Ah. Ah, chico, no quiere. Now, please, contigo, come here. Let's, let's back it up a little, huh? Senora Estabrook in libre, right? Si, senor. Okay. Now, where did she go? What direction? Uh, que direction? Oh, I already comprend. Uh-huh. The senor. Yeah, the senor. Que direction? Comprendo? Uh, si, senor. Senor Estabrook, go to the pier, the the fishing pier. Which one? Which fishing pier? There you uh, go. Qual pier? Uh, the small pier, senor. Uh-huh. The little one near the big canary. The fishes canary. That's senor. all I want to know. Gracias, amigo, and... Uh oh. Senor? Senor, what are you seeing? At? I'm not sure. But even if I were, I wouldn't be able to explain it to you. Buenas noches, pal. Thanks a lot. I had been seeing at the silhouette of a man huddled close to the ground and slinking out from a hotel along a high hedge that led back toward the statue in the body of Aiba. A man who I knew could be the elusive Popeyes. I followed the walk that was close into the hotel until I was on a line with a hedge. Then I started after him fast. I still had a good two yards to go when he heard me and pivoted, so I swung first! Oh! Why, you dirty... Roman, wait a minute, hold it! Gee, it's me, Marlo, I'm sorry. Oh! Holy smoke, I... I thought you were someone else. Oh, gargantua, maybe? Oh, brother. Oh, I'm sorry. What'd you hit me with? I have everything I had. <laughs> I figured you were Dolph Bentley, and <sighs> as such, Roman, I didn't want you to get away with murder, literally. Murder? Hey, not that girl you mentioned, Marlo. Oh, Estabrook? Huh? No, no, no. The corpse is that item you sigged away from me over in those ruins. Somebody got to him with his own knife there near the statue. Aha, uh-huh, then I was right. I did see someone move over Why? there. Well, yeah, a couple of minutes ago, Marlo. I was on the balcony outside of my room at face of the garden here, you see. And when I saw you run for the main entrance, I had a feeling that you might be in trouble again, so I came on down here. Well, then what happened? Well, I was about to call out to you when I heard some noise over there near the statue. It was a man. He was running away fast, heading toward those stables. A man wearing gabardine, maybe tan, maybe gray. Eye. Maybe Dolph Bentley. Thanks, Roman. You've been a big help. When you get back to the hotel, tell him about the dead man, will you? I gotta run. The stable was a robust left fielder's peg to home plate from where we'd been standing. So by the time I got there, I was out of breath and facing nothing more important than thick darkness, a lot of hay, and a couple of horses who couldn't sleep nights talking things over. Until I moved around a corner past the stalls and close to the half-open door of a shack, marked both cabina telefono and the equivalent in English that showed a single unshaded light. And under that, a man standing alone next to a telephone, writing something on the back of an envelope. He was wearing a gray gabardine suit, and when he lifted his Popeyes from the paper in front of him, I knew the next move had to be mine, 38 and all. Let it go, Buster. Keep your hands close to your sides. Just as you say, senor. I'd be a fool not to obey you. You're so right, a dead fool. So keep that in mind while we chat, won't you, Mr. Bentley? Bentley? Uh Uh-huh. How did you find out who I am? It was easy. All I had to do was listen to a dying man's last two words when I asked him to name his murderer. He said, Dolph Bentley, any comment? Yes, you know a lot, senor. Don't resent it, friend. I learned it all the hard way. Don't move, Bentley. I was only changing my position, senor. Which will be prone if you try it again. Now, what do you know about this whole mess and an American girl named Ona Estabrook who I figure is no mobster? Nothing, senor. You're a liar, Bentley. Which brings me to the point. One, why the pressure on the girl, and two, what's so important about her taking a ride on a fishing boat? Come on, brother, it's getting late for a murderer. Start talking straight the first time out. All right. I'll start with a question. Senor, how does all this concern you? You gain a percentage if the smugglers are not interfered with, perhaps? 
We were talking about the girl, remember? Yes, I remember. But you see, senor, I have little to offer on that score. How little? A single observation. In your country, senor, people who do not mind their own business are called nosy. Here in Mexico, we have another term. Asno. Which means what? Jackass, senor. Who, unlike the cat, cannot see in the dark. <laughs> but can try his best, Bentley. No gun, senor. Okay, amigo, no gun, but this. <clears throat> Asno. When Bentley met the floor and went out cold, I sagged to one knee. Stayed that way until the air rushing into my lungs quit sounding like sandpaper over a drumhead. Then I got back to my feet and turned on a bracket lamp on the other side of the room. I opened Bentley's jacket, slipped his 32 automatic out of its shoulder holster, emptied the clip, and... Stopped dead at the shimmer of light dancing on polished silver that I hadn't expected. It was a badge. Below his shoulder holster and pinned to his vest. Republic of Mexico, Department of Customs, Captain! I made a dive for the envelope near the telephone. On the back there was writing in thick pencil, which I finally figured to mean fishing pier near Cannery, 2 a.m. Inside, nothing. On the front, further proof that I'd never met Mr. Dolph Metley at all, but instead it tangled hard-like with one Captain Juan Descartos intelligence section custom building, Mexico City, Mexico. While trying to revive Captain Descartos, the truth rammed into my mind. Owner Estabrook had rushed off for the pier near the cannery that Captain Descartos had noted is a good place to be at 2 o'clock in the morning, which was less than 20 minutes away, and a great time for me to get to my car and the pier. <laughs> Work, senor. Yeah, you're a bright boy. Thanks. <clears throat> you like the job on the car, senor? I think it shines well for the eight pesos you owe me. Uh, nobody asked you to bother, Junior, but I'll see you later. Right now, I gotta run, huh? For eight pesos, one dollar you can write, senor. I'll replace the distributor cap. What? Come here, you. But, but senor, it was very dirty all over inside, too. The steering wheel black as can be. Look, I, I ruined my best drag cleaning That's it. tough. Now give me that distributor cap or you'll be the saddest pair of dark eyes between here and the Panama Canal. Senor! Oh, never mind. Here. You pay me the dog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just put the cap back where it belongs. Quick, will you? I'm in a hurry. Well, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Just 60 seconds ticked off before I was out of the parking lot and driving fast toward the fishing pier near the cannery, where I knew I was finally going to get next to Dolph Bentley and if I made it in time, prevent another murder. But when I screeched to a stop away from the pier, piled out of my car and ran the length of the oil-soaked planking to where a single boat was making ready to cast off, I saw one of the two persons aboard the small catch was owner Estabrook. The other was Lou Roman, haughty American fisherman. When I stepped aboard, our hunch hit me right between the eyes. I pulled my gun and pointed it an inch above his waist. What are you doing here, Marlo? I might ask you the same question, Roman, or do I call you Bentley from here on out? Marlo, you know, now he can't kill me. Now I don't have to be afraid of him anymore. Oh, Marlo, thank goodness you got here in time. Yeah, hooray. The Marines have landed in the form of a private... Cut it out, Bentley, and don't move. Oh, no, what do you mean about being afraid? What's your connection with this fisherman here? Look, it was an accident, Marlo. A mix-up in our baggage... Lou Roman and I both happened to stop for customs inspection at the border at the same time, and our suitcases were switched. I didn't notice it at the time, but when I got to the hotel, I discovered the mistake and went to Roman's room to correct it. But instead, you found Bentley here posing as Roman, right? Yes. He killed him, Marlo. He told me he did. That's a dirty lie, Roman's all right. He's in Chicago. No, he's not. He's dead. You killed him. Someplace between here and Tijuana, Marlo. He said I'd get the same treatment if I opened my mouth. Then he's the one who forced you to go out on that boat yesterday. Stay outside. back, Bentley. Yes. So that people wouldn't be suspicious, he made me appear at the hotel, in the patio there, at the restaurant. Well, why didn't you run? Well, I couldn't. He wasn't around. Another man was. A horrible man with large eyes that never left me. Yeah. So why don't you drop it, Marlo? No sale, Bentley. You see, I know that the horrible man with the large eyes can't be one of your henchmen. His badge says so. What? Badge? He's an officer, Marlo? Yeah, Captain Owner. Give up, Bentley? You had better. There are too many men ready to take you. Descados. <laughs> Where'd you come from? Oh, I have been here quite a while. But your story was so interesting, I just couldn't interrupt. When 
when Marlo took you for Dolph Bentley, Captain Descartes, you played along because you didn't know who he was, is that it? Yes, senora, and I did not find out until I heard Bentley call Marlo a private eye. <laughs> You're not mad at me, Captain, huh? Even though I bungled your plan to capture Martinez, and uh, not to mention our little meeting at the stables. <laughs> uh, senor, do not say that you bungled the job of catching Martinez. It was more a matter of uh, priority. Uh, por favor, senor, the tacos. Of course, here you are. Gracias. You see, Senor Marlowe, I am certain that one day I will catch Martinez, but not at the cost of letting a murderer kill again. Mm. But, Senor Marlowe, there is one thing that puzzles me. The murder of the one known as Haiba. Oh, Martinez henchman. Well, you see, Captain, he knew that a man named Dolph Bentley was mixed up in this because he'd overheard Ona and her keeper, then called Lou Roman, talking about him. He wanted to know more. Also, he couldn't figure who I was. So he beat you up? Correct. Bentley, of course, only saved my life because... It was an easy way to find out just how much Haiba did know, after which he got to him. Enough? Not quite, senor. There is still one thing. How did you know that Lou Roman was actually Bentley? On a hunch, Captain. And by positive identification from you, Ono, when we were on the boat. But um, now it's my turn. I got a question for you, honey. Have you had enough vacation? Uh-huh. Matter of fact, Marlo, I wired my husband just before we came in to eat. Oh. I... I said the change did in your world good. Be home tomorrow to stay. Love always. Well, Captain, will you pass the tacos, please? They're, they're awfully good, really. It was late the next afternoon, and Ona Estabrook was already gone when I checked out of the hotel. Said goodbye to Captain Dos Cados. Adios, amigo and headed north to the border, where two hours later I stopped for customs inspection of my baggage. It was dark, and I was only 50 miles from Los Angeles before I realized exactly what that inspection had meant. Because it was then, for the first time, that I noticed the little cowhide suitcase on the seat next to me, which should have been mine, was tagged differently. The name and address of a man who lived in Long Beach, California. When I got there, I kept driving. I knew I could ship it to him and ask for mine in exchange when I got home. Oh, yes. I'd had just about enough for a while. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Mary Ship, Harry Bartell, Nestor Piva, Bill Boucher, Ralph Moody, Bill Shaw, and Jerry Farber. The special music is written by Richard Aron. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with death on my doorstep and got worse when I lied to a sympathetic bull, was pistol whipped by a gorilla with dimples and fought with a kitten on the keys. And it might have gone on that way all night if I hadn't been helped by the king of the beasts. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. And those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison, or the grave. It started with death on my doorstep and got worse when I lied to a sympathetic bull, was pistol whipped by a gorilla with dimples, and fought with a kitten on the keys. And it might have gone on that way all night if I hadn't been helped by the king of the beasts. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The August Lion. one of those in-between hours, along about ten on a night at home when you don't quite know what to do with yourself. Then all of a sudden it's eleven, and then eleven-thirty. 
And you're in slippers and a robe and have done nothing. <laughs> Which is exactly where I was. Except that I'd already decided on one, and only one, very dry martini, a quiet cigarette, and bed. When it came loud, insistent, and unwelcome. No improvement when I opened up and saw less than five hey. feet of excited cab hey. driver jumping up hey, and down. Mister. Mister, you Doc Marlowe? Yeah, I'm Doc... Doc Marlowe. That's right. Here he comes with a doc. You better make room. Is the sofa there okay? I'll clear it off. Wait a minute, Jack. Who comes? Who? Okay, mister. Bring her on in. The doc's here, all right. Hey, doc, is she stiff? She's out like a light. Who? The babe. Who do you think? Sure too bad some people can't drink, huh, Doc? Yeah, it's real tough. Now tell me, do you... Hello, Phil. That's an angel. I'm sorry to bust in on you this way. Is the sofa all right? No, it's stuffed with granite. Put her in the bedroom. Okay, will you take care of the driver, please? Yeah, yeah. How much, friend? Well, uh, only 80 cents on a meter, Doc. A couple of bucks ought to cover it here. Good night. Good night, Diamond Jim. Well, Phil, I guess I'd better explain all this. Uh Uh-huh. Here, I haven't seen you in six months, and when I do... Never mind up... the details, Judd Boy. Let's talk about the problem. Who's the girl? Her name's Voss. Eileen Voss. She's kind of a stockbroker. Maybe speculator's a better term. You know, takes big chances with other people's money. I was in love with her, Phil, until tonight. When what happened? When I found out I was just one of many, it, it threw me, Phil. I really lost my temper. I swore I'd kill her on sight. Yeah, most guys do at a time like that, Judd. What's that got to do with her being drunk? By the way, while we're talking, I'll put on some coffee. No. No, don't, Phil. Why not? Because it can't help. She had a shot too many, all right. Only this one's a bullet in her head. She's dead. Oh, fine. Now, Phil, listen, please. You've got to help me. I've got to find out who did it. Phil, it started a couple of hours ago when I found out she'd been playing me for a sucker. I went to her place the first time in a week, boiling mad. The door was open. Judson Angel's eyes never left my face as he told the story from the beginning. A girl's body on the couch when he walked in, a neat hole in the back of her head. The gun he knew she owned shoved under a pillow. Then in the next second, before he could even look in the other rooms, the arrival of the cabbie somebody'd called who thought Eileen was just another drunk who had to be shown the way to go home. How he seized on that as an opportunity to keep from being placed at the scene of the murder he had every reason to commit. How minutes after he was in the cab, he realized he was near my place. How to avoid suspicion, he said I was a doctor. Everything except why, specifically, he was so afraid of the police. I knew that was going to be next. Now, Phil, I suppose you want to know why I couldn't... couldn't possibly call the police. Yeah, that's right. Why? Because I'd surely be booked and fingerprinted. And that had ruined me. You see, a long time ago, I said time in the state penitentiary in Illinois. What? Yes, yes, so I've kept it quiet. Only Phoebe Hammond in my office knows... It was for forgery, Phil. It was under another name and way back when I didn't know the difference between clever business and crooked business. Mm. It's taken ten years to work up my reputation as an accountant. So you see, if I get mixed up in this, it'll all come out and... Well, smash, lots of pieces, no more. Oh, you've got to help me, Phil. You've got to find the real killer before the police get to me. Please, Phil. I can't, Judd. They'd be smashing just as many little pieces for me, too, if I tried to pull anything like this on homicide. No, I'm sorry, Judd. I've got to report this body. But, Phil, look. What if you do report the body, but you say that you don't know anything about it, that you're going out to find what you can? What about that, Phil? Oh, please. Please, Phil. Okay. What's the girl's address? 91 Hollycrest Drive. 91 Hollycrest. Yeah, the, the door wasn't locked, Phil. Mm-hmm. Your phone number, Judd? Gladstone 3926. 3926. I won't move out of my place until I hear from you. Now, make sure you don't, Judd. Because if I can't find the real killer, I've got to tell what I know about you. You understand that, don't you? When Angel left, I called Detective Lieutenant Matthews at police headquarters and lied that there was a corpse in my apartment about which I knew nothing, and that I was on my way out to see what I could find. Then I hung up fast, not feeling very good. Twenty minutes later, when I was in the plush living room at 91 Hollycrest Drive, I had zero to go on. Until I got to the bedroom where, caught in the folds of lace at the bottom of a petticoated vanity... I found a piece of male jewelry that stood out against that backdrop like argyle socks on a turtle. It was a gold tie clasp ornamented with the figure of a lion, a little more majestic than most. I dropped it into my pocket and then moved out into a long hall that led to the kitchen. I was about to start toward it when he spoke. Don't move, buddy. Like the voice, he was thick and soft, especially in the middle where he was girdled in double-breasted gray flannel. So I couldn't tell whether he was plus or minus a tie clasp. Also, he had no hair. 
and a pair of deep dimples that danced when he talked. A gun in his hand didn't. Okay, turn around. Let's go back to the living room, buddy. I want to ask you a few questions. Like why you're taking inventory here. Well, it's my job. You see, I'm an auctioneer. The lady of the house won't need this stuff anymore. She's not going to... Shut up. Uh... Now stop where you are. And don't turn around. Okay, where's the girl? Come on, come on, where is she? Out. And only if you'll tell me why you want to know will I tell you where. You see, that way I come out even. Yeah, maybe. Lyleen Voss owes me money, buddy, and I want it now before she's flat broke. Now you, where is she? On her way to the morgue. Like you don't know. Well, what do you mean by that? I didn't kill her? Honest, Injun. Listen, you. Get this straight. I came into this place just now for one reason only. To check on the Voss girl and make sure she wasn't on her way out of town, bag and baggage in hand, and my 50 grand. Now, don't forget that. I'll try not to. And don't move. Hello. Uh, no. No, she's not here. She is... Judy? Yeah. yeah it's me, honey. No, no, she's, um... She's out. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll tell you about it later at, at, at the club. Yeah. Right, Judy. So long. Now, where were we, buddy? In the middle of a big fat lie, a reason for being here. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's where we were. And you know, that's a good old place to leave it. Ah! Oh, buddy. Twin telephones, lamps, and end tables next to me got back to being one of each again. I saw the note next to the phone that said, Call Monday at the garden room. This didn't add to much until I realized that Monday was spelled not as the day in the week, but M U N D Y. I recall that the garden room was a cozy collection of crepe paper flowers where some people did their serious drinking. That plus dancing dimples telling a girl named Judy who had called for Eileen in the first place. That he'd meet her at the club was a little better than the zero-plus tie class I'd been working with. And a half hour later, that little became a lot and things started to dovetail because a placard under glass in front of the garden room bragged about the glamour pianist featured inside, whose name was first Judy, second Monday, not his day in the week. I blessed my good luck, exchanged smiles only with a hat check girl in the lobby, and found a table for one inside, not more than a half a dozen octaves away from Miss Monday's left hand. I'd ordered a drink and had a cigarette going before she paid any attention to me. I'll play anything you want. It's a rule of the house. Just name it, or hum it, or whistle. But don't croon. That's also a rule of the house. What'll it be? How about the number you always play for that fat friend of yours? You know, the one with the deep dimples? Burlesque? Hmm. <laughs> sure. Kind of corny. Remember it? Yeah. You a friend of his? Not exactly. I didn't think so. He'd crown you if he heard you say dimples. He's sensitive. You're new here, aren't you? I've been in once or twice. Mutual friend of ours used to speak well of you. Eileen Voss. What made her change her mind? She was murdered tonight. Any idea who did it? I said any... I heard you. No, Mitch, I haven't got the slightest idea. There, that's the end of your request. Sorry, but I'm only allowed one to a customer. It's a rule it's of a the rule. house, I know, yeah. I'll see you, Judy. Hello? This is Marlowe, Angel. Oh, oh, Phil. Where are you? What have you found out? In that order, I'm in a phone booth at a club called The Garden Room. What I found out so far won't impress Detective Lieutenant Matthews of the Homicide Squad at all when next we meet. But nothing in the apartment, no lead of any kind? I'm not sure, Judd. I ran into a round man with a sleek gun who piled me up and left before very much was said. But fill the garden room. The girl there's a friend of Eileen's. Talk to her. Yeah, yeah, I already did, Judd. Got me the round man's name and no more. It was Berleffi. You mean anything? Berleffi? Yeah. A fat guy with dimples and no hair? That's right. He claimed Eileen had 50 grand that belonged to him. Oh? Yes, he's a gray marketeer, comes from San Francisco. I've never seen him, but the girl in my office, Phoebe Hammond, can help us. Mm -hmm. She once did some auditing work for Berta, but she found out how crooked he was. She told me about him. I'll call her and have her meet you there, Phil. All right, but look, I'll be at a corner table facing the door, and tell her to hurry, will you? 
I'll call you back later. Goodbye. <laughs> Exactly one o'clock when what was at least three parts CPA to each part woman pushed the front door out of her way and entered. At the top, there was close-cropped hair, streaked with some gray, no hat. At the bottom, dark brown stockings running into darker brown shoes, no heels. In between, severely tailored tweed closed tight at the neckline. It took all of 15 efficient seconds to decide that I was her man. And less than that again to introduce herself, ask for a cigarette, and name her drink. When it was my turn to talk, I brought her up to date. Eileen Boss's murder included. It's too bad, Marlo. Judd's a great guy. Yeah. It was only lunch today that he was knocking himself out, trying to figure what would be 4 for my birthday next week. <laughs> now this. Tell me, what can I do to help? Well, at the moment, Berleffi. All I know about him is Hammond. Aside from what I've told you, he said at Eileen's, is that he and Judy Monday are a team. And Judy was a friend of Eileen. <laughs> How cozy. Isn't it? Well, it goes like this. Belletti's front name is Steve, and he's out of San Francisco via Detroit and Chicago. And in each case, only a length of the subpoena ahead of the law. Oh? Back in the 30s, he was a mobster. The numbers game, protection racket, that kind of stuff. But after the war, he cashed in all his chips and went into a more or less legitimate business. With, of course, absolutely no change in tactics. Know what you mean. Now, look, can you tell me where he lives? No. But I'll bet my bottom dollar that the kitten on the keys here can. Mm. Only be careful. The lefty has a reputation for shooting first and talking later. I only hope he isn't after Judd, too. You know, there might be some connection between them that goes back to the days when Judd was Francis Lyon and Belletti... Phoebe, a... did you just say Francis Lyon? That's right. L-Y-O-N. Uh-huh. Judson Angel is the name he took when he came out here. Why? What does that mean? I don't know. Here, look at this tie clasp. Huh? The ornament. It's also a lion. I found it in the bedroom at Eileen's place, and yet Judd told me that he hadn't gone past the living room. But, but Marlo, that doesn't prove that Judd lied. Why, it might not be his at all. Hmm. Have you ever seen it before? No, I haven't. Besides, I never knew Judd to wear a tie class. Okay. Could belong to Berleffi. But it's still worth checking after we get Judd out of his apartment. Look, where's your place, Phoebe? Mulholland Drive, 361 North. 361. About a mile up into the hills. I'll let you do the trick. Honey, you go home and stay close to the fireside. I'll get a hold of Judd and tell him to get over there fast. And then maybe we... We can... Maybe we can what? What is it, Marla? Outside, Phoebe. It's a man coming this way. The lefty? Worse. Goodbye, baby. I'll see you later at your place. I've been afraid of this all night. But who is it? What's his name? Detective Lieutenant Matthews. He's a police officer, Phoebe. First, last, and always. So long. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, music you like best of all, whether it's classical favorites or popular old ballads, is the music you hear when you tune in Sunday afternoon to the Symphonette and the Choral Ears. This Sunday, the Symphonette plays popular operatic pieces and has as guest Milton K., pianist, who will play the final movement from Rachmaninoff's Concerto No. 2 in C minor. The male choir and Lenny Stokes, featured baritone of the chorus, will bring you Pale Moon, The Wizard of Oz, Alice Blue Gown, Make Believe, and other favorites. Yes, it's the music you like when you tune in the Symphonette and the Choral Ears every Sunday over most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The August Lion. I left Phoebe Hammond at the table and moved toward the bar. My first impulse was, run, do not walk. This is a different kind of an emergency. But a quick glance into the mirror behind me tagged that as suicide and pushed try nonchalance into its place because I could see that Detective Lieutenant Matthews had already spotted me. When he was closer, I could also see that nonchalance would go over like uh, punching him in the nose on the steps of City Hall. All right, Phil, that little game is over. Now let's have it straight and fast. <clears throat> Who are you working for? And don't bother with the pitch on professional ethics, so we'll try this all over again down at headquarters. His name, what is it, Phil? Judson Angel, he's a friend. Yeah. Who is what to the corpse? He was in love with her, but he didn't kill her. Oh. Now, look, Matthews, I've never held out on you before, have I? 
Which means you want to start now, huh? What are you getting at, Phil? My client's in a jam, Lieutenant. He didn't kill the girl, but unless I can find out who did, he's an eyebrow deep in a mess that doesn't even concern him. Which has what to do with you playing bashful tipster on the phone with a body being in your bedroom and Marlowe starring like a one-man police force? Will you listen? Come I... on, Phil. I've been an hour and a half just finding you. Now, level. Why is this Judson Angel in a jam if he didn't do it? Okay, okay. We'll try it honestly. like. He once did time in another state under another name way back when he had less sense. Ah. If he's booked and fingerprinted, it'll be splashed all over the papers. He'll be ruined. Why? What's his business? Well, today it's accountancy and then it was forgery. Oh. You can see that side by side, they don't make a very handsome couple. Now, come on, Matthews. Give the guy a break, will you? Take my word. He deserves it. What do you want me to do? Give me some time. If I don't have the answers, I'm out of luck and so is Judson Angel. Please, Matthews. All right, all right, Phil, all right. Sixty minutes. Hey. And if I don't hear from you by 10 after 2, we start all over again down at headquarters, your client included. I'll be waiting for your call, Phil. Good night. Detective Lieutenant Matthews was nobody's keystone cop, and I knew that when he said 60, count him 60 minutes, he meant just that and no more. So I found a nice and public phone booth at a gas station across the street, and while I kept one eye out for Berlethi and Associates, I dialed Judson Angel's number. But in the next second, when I was through to him, I knew that I could forget about Berletti on my end. Bill, I'm in trouble here. Outside a man and woman. They're coming up the walk now. He's fat and gray flannel? Yes, yes. She just pulled up in a cab, but he's been out there 20 minutes watching the place. Berletti, listen, Judd, get out the back way. Get over to Phoebe's place. Oh, uh, he's out the door now, Phil. He's kicking it in. Phil, Phil, get up here. 21 South Orange Lane. Judd, do as I say, will you? Get out. Get to Phoebe's place on Mulholland Drive. I'll see you there. Hurry. All right, Marlo. All right. Marlo, he's in. Judd! Put that phone down, Angel, or I'll kill you. Now. When I screeched to a stop at number 21 South Orange Lane, which was lights out, front door open, and no car parked in sight, I went inside. Just visible in the moonlight was the huddled figure I'd been afraid I'd find. What I didn't know until I was nearly next to it was that it was Judy Mundy, not my client, and only unconscious, not dead. There was a large white envelope lying next to her, and beyond that, a litter of broken porcelain that had once been a lamp. I switched on a light, found some brandy, and then brought her to oh. as fast as I could. Oh. Oh. Marlo. Yeah, and with a brand new request. Here, take a drink. Huh. Now, I'll ask the questions. One, what happened here with the three of you? Where's Berleffi and, more important, Judd Angel? Come on, baby, talk fast. All right. I think Angel got away. I don't know where he is. Berleffi? Dead, I hope. I got him to thank for that lamp getting together with my head. How come? Angel made a break for it, kicked out the lights and tossed the lamp at the same time. Hero Berleffi used me for a shield, then took off after him. Mm. Your connection with both Berleffi and Eileen Voss, what was it? I forget. Come on, Judy, baby, talk. You're not going to get another chance this side of the witness box. Wit witness box? What for? Your girlfriend's murder, trial by jury, an old Yankee tradition, oh, you remember? Oh, I didn't have anything to do with Eileen getting killed. They can't tie that onto me. They can try. Now, what'll it be? It'll be... It'll be what you want. That's better. I only got chummy with Eileen in the last month, Marlo, because Berleffi told me to. He was my boyfriend. Hooray for love. Go on. What was in it for Berleffi? He wanted to know where Eileen got her tips on the market. That way he could keep paying her any commission. Figures. What went wrong? Nothing. Only instead of finding out how well she knew who, I discovered she was going broke, period. The rest of it, you, Eileen, being dead, that muscle woman you talked to in the bar. All wait a minute, you... wait a minute, wait a minute. What about that girl in the bar? You two get together? Oh, not for very long. Mm. After you left the table, she went outside, so I followed. Why? Because the cow jumped over the moon. Why do you think? I was still working for the left, they remember? I thought it would help if he knew how, where she fit in. What'd it get you? A slap in the face. I said she was raised on barbells. And this envelope here that fell out of her pocket. Oh? Don't get excited about it. It's only one of those horoscope charts. What do you do? Collect them as a hobby? When there are notes on the back, yeah. However, for a friend, Berleffi was unimpressed. Yeah, look yourself. It's double talk. Mm. Cost plus, what, 10%. 90 days, will you listen? Yeah, it's strictly a CPA's margin notes. Doesn't mean it, you... Well, your mouth's open. What is it? You look dumb. Dumb I am and have been all night. Sweetheart, in your own clumsy way, you may have saved Judson Angel's life. What are you talking about, Marla? According to this horoscope, it's written in the stars. Maybe I'll make a good cop happy. Goodbye, sweets. Mulholland Drive. 
Hollywood is a fancy collection of hairpin turns and deceptive curves along the top of a mountain that separates Hollywood and Beverly Hills from the San Fernando Valley. But when I was on it and burning up good rubber at each bend as I headed for number 361 North, gas pedal on the floor. Driving conditions were the least of my worries. And it wasn't until I had parked away from the bungalow that perched on the edge of a cliff and was out of my car, 38 in hand and close to a half-open French window, that I breathed a long, long sigh of relief. Because then I could clearly see that Judson Angel was still alive. I swallowed the sigh fast when I could also see Angel's face. It said there was nothing permanent about his good health. Because on the other side of the room, and only visible to me via a corner mirror, was the reason why. Holding on tight to a short, ugly revolver was the one the horoscope had said could be Eileen Voss's killer. The CPA known as Phoebe Hammond. While she talked, I moved around to where I'd be able to take aim in one straight line. About everything. I didn't want to kill Eileen in the first place. It was an accident. I don't believe you. It doesn't matter now. You see, I'd invested some money with her, Judge. Money that wasn't mine. When I found out she was going broke, I went up to see her and demanded it back. She laughed at me. I got mad. I hit her. She took out a gun and said she'd call the police if I didn't leave. I grabbed it away from her. Then I shot her. Then you were there when I came in? Yes. And when I saw you and that cab driver she'd called earlier take the body, I, I didn't know what to do. Until later, when I met with Marlowe on your behalf and learned all about Belefi and the tie class he'd done. The tie class with the lion on it that you'd recognize as mine if Marlowe ever got the chance to show it to you. But he won't, Judd. I can't let him. Phoebe, Phoebe, you're crazy. You're crazy. You'll never get away with it. Oh, yes, I will, Judd. It'll be Belefi they'll blame. He entered your room with a gun in his hand. I know. I saw him and that girl... Also, Judd, I'm the reason you got away from him. I rammed into his car when he started after you. It's too bad, Judd. Worse than that, Phoebe, it's a crying shame. Marlo! Lights! The lights jump, Phil. She can see your silhouette. I can follow her footsteps. We're even. Phil, the terrace. She's trying to get away. There she is outside. She tripped Phil. The rail! Holy smoke. Phil, it's a it's a good two hundred feet down to solid rock. Yeah. Run away from it, Judd. Time we made a phone call. It was four o'clock in the morning. We were still on top of the mountain before the police had found the broken body of Phoebe Hammond. Berlefi had been picked up, and in lieu of anything better booked for breaking and entering Eileen Voss's place. When the parade of law, press, and just curious who always show up at the scene of a murder had finally left, I'd made it just me and Judd and a cop named Matthews. Well, let me see if I got this straight for the records, Phil. First, you thought it was a tough called Berlefi. And second, you were afraid you'd been a sucker and it was really your client. And finally, you figured it had to be a woman who all the way looked like she was no more than along for the ride. Huh? What? You mean you really believe I could have done it, Phil? Uh, well, yeah, it, it looked that way for a while, Judd. You know, you said you hadn't been past the living room up at Eileen's, and yet I found a tie clasp in the bedroom there ornamented with a lion. And then I found out your real name was also lion. It almost added. Yeah, but since you didn't have a chance to find out whether or not Berlefi was missing a tie clasp, you still consider that was only circumstantial evidence, all right? Right, yeah. yeah. Until I ran into the switch, which was an envelope that had belonged to Phoebe Hammond. There was a horoscope chart inside. Which meant what? Well, it only meant that she went in for that stuff no more until... I remembered her mentioning that her birthday was next week, which is early August. And that, no doubt, puts her under the sign of the Zodiac run by one Leo the Lion. Uh -huh. uh. Yes. Yes, and the mannish tight neck suit she always wore could have meant a shirt and tie underneath. Minus clasp. Exactly, gentlemen. <laughs> That's it. Uh, <clears throat> now, me, Lieutenant. Uh, what? Look, when you get back down to headquarters and, you, you know, you start the paperwork. Yeah. Do you have to mention a guy named Judson Angel? Uh, a guy named what? Judson Angel. Mm. <laughs> 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 nothing, nothing. I, I, I was just thinking out loud. Yeah, yeah, that's mm. a bad practice, Phil, you know? It's kind of like only <laughs> telling a policeman half of what you know can uh, get you in trouble. Mm. Unless you're lucky. 
Oh, uh, give your left, Mr. Uh, you, <laughs> you already have. Thanks, Lieutenant. And Phil, I... Good night, Judd. When Judd and the lieutenant left, I figured I'd have a last cigarette on the terrace. Think a little about the desperate people I'd met on a night that it started out to be quiet. I found myself not smoking, not watching the early sun brighten the valley below. And not thinking about much of anything except the overturned stone flower pot that was lying next to the splintered rail where Phoebe Hammond had tripped and taken her final plunge. It was an ordinary square flower pot with an ordinary flower in it. But the figure in relief on the side was a lion resting on its haunches. And you know, as I looked at it, I thought it was a little more majestic than most. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and was directed tonight by Cliff Howell. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, D.J. Thompson, Wally Mayer, Barney Phillips, and Jerry Hausner. Lieutenant Detective Matthews is played by Larry Dotkin. The special music is written by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with an Indian gift of a piece of pottery and led to a brown bear and moccasins, an archaeologist, much laughing water, and finally, death in an alley. But just to make matters worse, the Indian giver was a female and 100% genuine hot-blooded Apache. <laughs> Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison, or the grave. It started with an Indian gift of a piece of pottery and led to a brown bear and moccasins. An archaeologist, much laughing water, and finally, death in an alley. But just to make matters worse, the Indian giver was a female and 100% genuine hot-blooded Apache. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Indian Giver. Today, the industrial heart of any city is just so much steel and stone and streets, jammed full with the raucous sounds of a thousand and one different machines. But by night, all of that is gone, and there are only endless, smooth-sided, lonely canyons that overflow with a steady, humming silence that everywhere hangs like a distant echo of the day that's passed. And Los Angeles was no exception at nine o'clock at night, as I pulled up and parked in front of a grace curtain storefront on a deserted downtown street. It marked the showroom of the wholesale curio dealer who had telephoned my office an hour earlier. And in a Dutch accent laced tight with worry, it urged me to call on him at once. A raised gold lettering on a side door that showed a strip of yellow light at the threshold said Alex Van Nord, private, in an ornate 18th century script. So when I knocked, I was ready for something continental with thick bifocal glasses. When the door swung open, my jaw dropped to my chest. And I couldn't help gaping because the huge V of a man in front of me in cheap, snug clothes, white dark hair, dark skin, and darker eyes. Had to be no less than a full-blooded American Indian. Moccasins and all. What do you want? Uh, Mr. Van Nord, is he in? 
Name your business. Well, it's personal. What's yours? Hate. For those who would destroy our culture. Oh! Oh. Mr. Marlowe. Oh. Mr. Marlowe, let me help you up, sir. Oh. Oh. I'm Fenor. Uh, Are you all right? Oh, sure, sure. I'm fine. Hey, that engine, he certainly can hit hard, Oh, huh? yes, I know. He also struck me, though. Huh? Ach, I tell you, Mr. Marlow, it's terrible. Yeah, it's also a little confusing, Mr. Van Nord. Hey, exactly why did you call me in the first place? Oh, well, it began this morning when I received a shipment of Indian curios from my buyer in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh? Well, everything in the crate was in order, except one extra piece of pottery. A bowl. A bowl? Indian bowl? Yes, yes. Oh. it appeared no place on the invoice. Oh, I didn't pay much attention to it till I noticed that the two-inch wide band of inscriptions near the top were not like any others I'd ever seen. Inscriptions, eh? Yeah. No, you mean those Indian signs, broken arrow, deer, wigwam kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so my curiosity was aroused, and I called my representative in Santa Fe. Uh-huh. However, he knew nothing of the bowl either, so finally... Well, I put it in my display window there and forgot about it. Until about noon, when a frail, sandy-haired man stepped in. You know his name? No, no. Uh Only that he said he was an archaeologist and that he wanted to buy the ball. He refused to sell it, huh? Uh, Why? For two reasons, Mr. Marlowe. One, I could see that he was fighting hard to control his enthusiasm. And two... I had no idea what to charge for the bowl. Mm-hmm. I told him to come back tomorrow again, and then I removed the bowl from the window. It wasn't until five o'clock that the second visitor appeared. Another archaeologist? No, no. A beautiful girl named Mona Waters. Oh. She was very sophisticated, wore an expensively tailored white, uh, smart suit, no jewelry she wore whatsoever. Mm. She described the bowl I had placed in my storeroom perfectly. And then asked if I had seen such a piece of pottery or if I had one for sale. I said no. Same reason? More or less. Mm. Anything else, Mr. Van Owen? Well, there isn't much more. The young lady gave me her address. The Walker Hotel on Wilshire Boulevard. Uh, room 515. Walker Hotel. Uh, asked me to call her if I came across a bowl like the one she described. Then she left. Naturally, my interest at this time was near the bursting point. Naturally. What'd you do about it? The only sensible thing I knew of. At six o'clock, I closed my place and and went to the public library to borrow a book on hieroglyphics of the Indians of the Southwest. When I got back, I found the rear door forced and poof, the ball was gone. And you called me? Yes. Then this Indian shows up. He claims I would rob his people of everything and then he hit me. Makes perfect sense to him, no doubt. Yes. No... Will you try to recover the bowl for me, please? Well, if you can answer one question without stumbling, yeah. Huh? Why no police, Mr. Van Nord? Uh, because objects of art, Mr. Marlowe, aside from their intrinsic worth, and, and the clay bowl has none, are only valuable for resale. Create a public disturbance, such as the police, and the thief will destroy the object and another day steal again. Mm-hmm. No, please, please, you try, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, I'll try, all right, Mr. Van Norden. When it comes to our two-fisted brave who's so crazy about the preservation of Indian culture, I'll try real hard. Good night, sir. Van Norden's enthusiasm and the hundred bucks he pressed into my hand before I left were encouraging, and I drove straight to the Walker Hotel on Wilshire Boulevard, where a moment after I entered the plush lobby, encouragement came once more. Because gliding from a travel agency booth toward a cocktail lounge was what my client had described as beautiful girl, expensively tailored, smart white suit, no jewelry whatsoever. But when we were both inside and at adjoining stools at the bar, where the soft lights accented her high cheekbones and jet black hair, I knew that Mr. Van Nord had skipped something important, because in spite of a full mouth, neatly rouged, eyebrows, pencil, come hither, and a coiffure shingled vintage 1949, Mona Waters could also be full-blooded American Indian, which is what I was working on when she turned blew a smoke signal in my face and spoke with an accent that was about as Apache as Vassar. Don't let me make you lose your place, but uh, do you mind telling me why you're staring? I collect the reasons for a hobby. You know, like some people save stairs. Uh-huh. And others pottery. Ha- Who are you? A ceramics fiend named Smith. Now, Mona, let's talk about you, huh? Why? 
Because I've already been offered $10,000 for the bowl. What? Good enough? You have the bowl where? Well, not in my pocket, honey. It's too bulky. I've got it tucked safely away outside in my car. Oh? Yeah, you know, you didn't hide it very well after you stole it from Van Nord. You've been in my room. Could be. How do we talk business, yes or no? Yes. What do you want to know? Well, for one thing, what's the bowl to you? Everything. It's mine. All mine. Via primogeniture. Which is Apache for what? Listen, Mr. Smith. I'm an Indian, all right. And an Apache at that. But I was born in a duplex, not a TP. I drink martinis, not fire water, and I've got a Mill College diploma and an IQ that'll probably make yours look sick. So let's clear the air in a hurry. Yeah, well, let's clear enough, then. Now, smart boy. My late Uncle George Waters, also known as Chief Laughing Waters. Giggle if you want to. Own the bowl you want $10,000 for. So? So a long time ago, he willed it to my father. However, my father died a year ago, leaving only me as heir apparent. Since that bowl is mine, all mine, via primogeniture, which brings us right back to where we were. Except you haven't mentioned why the bowl means so much to you. And I won't. No, will you pay the 10,000 bucks, huh? I didn't say that. And I won't say anything more until I see that bowl. Now, I've got to make a couple of calls. Should take about 20 minutes. After that, I'll be in my room. Please call before you come up. And if you don't have the bowl, don't, don't come, come up. up. Okay, baby, fair enough. So long. It had been the kind of conversation piece wherein each party's quite sure that the other's a liar, but not quite sure why. So a moment after I was on the sidewalk and out of Mona's sight, I darted to the side of the hotel in the rear entrance where I made my way to a self-service freight elevator that got me to the fifth floor, just as the Apache with gloss closed the door to a room at the far end of the carpeted hallway. I was about halfway there when it came. <laughs> The door to 515 wasn't locked, and when I threw it open, I found about what I'd expected. Mona slumped in a corner of the room, pride heard only, and opposite her a wide-open window, which I figured led to a fire escape, until I was standing next to it and saw that there was nothing but sheer wall that plunged five stories to the sidewalk below, and on a line with the hotel's fourth floor, a rooftop, that at best was a good 15 feet away. When I closed the window and turned back to the room, Mona was already on her feet. That sly jerk. He waited till I had the door closed behind me, and then he swung. Oh, brother, when we meet again. Oh, Mona, who? Did he get the bowl? Get, get the bowl? I thought you had that, Smith. I was kidding, and you know it. Now, once more, who was it? His name, Mona. Jimmy Brown Bear. Jimmy which? Brown Bear. Smitty, a lot of Indians have Indian names. It's a custom. Try not to fall apart every time you hear one. I will if you'll stop being persecuted. I think Indians are all good Americans. Now tell me about the big brown bear. Okay. All right. <laughs> He's absolutely sold. The bull's a priceless tribal heirloom the white man's trying to steal. He's plain nuts. Who else would try a jump like that from a fifth-story window? Yeah, quite a hop. If he actually made it. What do you mean if? Nobody fell. No, maybe nobody jumped either. Maybe you make up heap big story, baby. Hide bowl here in closet, then fall on floor. Tell Wild Taylor, screwball Apache. That'd be smart. Yeah, heap. But also smart if you take long nose out of engine girl's affairs before it gets blown off. Stand still, buster. Yo, tomahawk, caliber 38. How unfriendly. But effective. Now, Smith, what's your real name? Sammy Blue Ox. My father Listen, calls me... Junior, let me clear up a very important point. That Indian bowl, in some strange way, is the answer to the location of enough lost Spanish gold to keep you, me, and everyone we ever met off the bread line from here on out. Okay, I'm intrigued with the points we're going to clear up. Just this. I've got a dandy idea where I can find both the bowl and Jimmy Brown Bear right now. That's something I want to do all by my lonesome. Now back into that closet and keep quiet. While well, you head where? On the warpath via bus. I'm a hot-blooded Apache, remember? So long, baby. There are times when things look black enough without staying put in a dark closet. So I kicked the lock, spun the casing, and walked out in the room 515 just in time to hear a timid knock on a hall door. When it opened up, one frail, sandy-haired man wanted information. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, sir. Hmm? Can you possibly tell me where I can find Miss Mona Waters? Who are you? <laughs> My name is Clark Erskine. I, I'm an archaeologist. Yeah, I'm sorry, friend. I can't say any more than Miss Waters is out after a wild-eyed Apache who's got a 
piece of pottery tucked underneath his arm. What? Oh, not the bowl. It's supposed to be in Van Nort's place. Not Jimmy Brown Bear. Yeah, right on both counts, Mr. Erskine, but what makes the name Brown Bear ring a bell? You two met before? Well, we certainly have. Mm. Why, that idiot has hampered every archaeologist who has so much as set foot in New Mexico. Well, now that you've mentioned it, Mr. Erskine, why your keen interest in the bowl? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? Yeah. Well, my good men, those inscriptions circled around it are going to prove invaluable. Possibly another uh, Rosetta Stone. An open sesame to the countless undecipherable writings we've already collected. About Spanish gold, maybe, huh? Spanish gold. Mm. Oh, well, sir, what are you talking about? Nothing. Look, Erskine, one question. How did you know that Mona Waters was staying here at this hotel? Well, it wasn't simple Not to bad. learn. Uh, when Mr. Van Nord refused to sell the bowl to me until tomorrow, mm. I wanted to be certain that he also didn't sell it to anyone else. So I watched his showroom. Oh, that's smart. <laughs> when I saw Miss Waters there, I recognized her at once as in the pantry, And I followed her here where I found out her name and room number. Now, I'm going to wait for her until she returns. I'm not going to give up. That bowl means now, too much. Now, wait a minute. Wait Why a minute. Hold it, Erskine. You happen to know Jimmy Brown Bear's hometown? Come on, quick. Well, yes, I do. It, it's Sacona, New Mexico. Sacona, New Mexico? Yes. By bus. Thank you, friend. I'm sorry to have to leave you to do your waiting alone, but i got to catch a bus. But where, Mr. Marlowe? At the downtown Central Bus Depot to put cart before horse, to turn tables, a switch. In short, Mr. Erskine to track an Indian. So long. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, you meet many an old friend from the wide field of music every Sunday afternoon when the choral ears and the symphonette are heard on most of these same CBS stations. This Sunday, the fine voices of the choral ears will recall such old favorites as I've Been Working on the Railroad, The Best Things in Life Are Free, and Janine, I Dream of Lilac Time. The symphonette will bring you the overture from The Bohemian Girl, a Strauss composition, and a stirring march, among others. Be sure to hear the symphonette and the choral ears to find your old friends and favorites every Sunday. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Indian Giver. Tracking an Indian over the busy concrete of downtown Los Angeles sounds a lot tougher than it turned out to be. Apparently, a six-feet-four Apache in a full-crown black hat and moccasins was an oddity even in a city of oddities. And everyone who'd seen him remembered him, from the guy behind the bus depot's ticket desk to the newsboy outside the flop house nearby, where Jimmy Brown Bear had made camp. The next bus was still 45 minutes away, so I decided to visit the flop house. But Jimmy Brown Bear must have seen me coming and was expecting trouble, because when I stepped into the hall, I saw him duck out the back door to the alley. I ran after him and watched him turn down what would have been a dead end to a normal man. But Jimmy made a jump at a nine-foot wall, caught the top, and was pulling himself up when it happened. Jimmy stiffened on the wall. When the second shot came, he dropped rigidly like a poison fly and lay very still. I started over to him, but stopped at the excited voice of a cabbie running toward me from the open end of the alley. Hey, hey, mister. Hey, hey, what happened? I heard a couple of shots, Jim, and I... Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, that's what you heard. Holy mackerel, Hey, wait, wait. That's the Indian. You mean you know him, too? Yeah, I hauled him around in my cab tonight. Who did it, mister? You? Ah, oh, don't be silly, will you? The shots could have come from any place. Any one of those windows is on fire. Oh, he... yeah? Yeah. Well, between those buildings there that... Hey, that dame running for the street. Will you get out of my way? Not so fast, buddy. You know her? Yes, I know. I'm on a waters. Brother, will you get the cops over here right away, will you? I gotta catch that girl. No chance, mister. She's long gone. Oh, no. Oh, no. Marlo, got you. Van Nord. <sighs> Oh, I certainly didn't expect to find you here. What in the world is going on here? Among other things, murder. Yeah, it's that Indian, Mr. Van Nord, the same one. What? Good heavens. Mr. Marlowe, did, did this happen because of the ball? No, God. Mona Waters just got away between those two buildings. Oh. I'm pretty sure she's the one who took the ball out of your place tonight because Jimmy Brown Bear got it away from her later. Now she's got it back again and he winds up like that. Then you think the girl killed him to recover the ball? Right now, I'm too balled up to think anything. Hey, just a minute. How do you manage to show up here? Uh, why, I I started home in this man's taxi and found out that he was the one who brought Mr. Brown Bear to my shop tonight. Yeah, that's right. I picked the Indian up right out here on the corner. Uh, so we came down here because I thought if we found where the Indian was staying, it might be a help to you, Marlowe. You were waiting in the cab when he was shot? No. 
no, I started into this place alone and then I thought better of it and came out to get you, Cabby, to come in with me. And then I heard the shot. Mm -hmm. Now look, Mr. Van Noord, you better keep your nose out of this mess. Huh? Go on home and sit on your curios. I'll call you when I got something. <laughs> Assuming that my client's story was true and that he did have the cabbie to back him up, I got in my car and headed back to the Walker house. I parked at the side of the hotel and started to that convenient rear door again when I saw the commotion of half a dozen excited passers-by bending over a man stretched out on the sidewalk. Hey, how do you like that? It's enough to make a fatalist out of you, ain't it? Absolutely. What happened? Why, that poor guy there is walking along minding his own business and practically gets his back broke by a hunk of pottery some jerk must have heaved out of one of them windows up there. Pottery? You mean a bowl, maybe? A broke? I, I, I don't know. It broke all the smithereens. It was plenty heavy, though. It was about... Hey, hey, look, look. Here's a chunk of it. Let me see that. Oh, sure. Brown clay with symbols carved on it. Indian symbols. Listen, uh, buddy, what window did that come out of? Anybody see? Anybody? No, no. They're all dark up there. We can't figure it out. We just... Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going? There was no doubt about it. A broken piece of pottery I'd clenched in my hand must have come from the Indian bowl. I ran inside, rode the elevator up to the fifth floor again, and beat it down the hall to 515. Sprawled out on the floor inside was Clark Erskine, the archaeologist, making a valiant but wobbly effort to get back on his feet. I dropped the chunk of bowl in my pocket and gave him a hand. Come on, fella. What? Up you go. Come on. What is it? All right. Take it easy. What? What? Now sit over here and tell me what happened to you. Where am I? Oh, who are you? Marlow, Marlow. Remember, you're oh. in room 515 of the Walker House. Oh. When I left, you were waiting for Mona Waters, but I came back to find you spread out on the floor, as flat as that puddle of ink there on the desk blotter. Now, you take it. How come all this? Oh, yeah, yes. I, I remember now. I was struck. Yeah, yeah. But, Marlow, the, the, the lights are out. And they're better left that way unless you want the room full of irate citizens. Who struck you? I have no idea. I was sitting at the desk there writing Miss Waters a note because I had decided not to wait any longer when I was hit from behind. That explains the spilled ink. What about the open window? It was closed when I left. Open window? Why, why, why that's strange. Strange, it's screwy. Nuts. What do you mean? Mr. Marlowe, just what is your position in this business? I'm a private detective working for Mr. Van Nord, and I'll tell you something else. Whoever slugged you, open that window and sail the precious Indian bowl right out into thin air, five stories high. Oh. Smashed down there on the sidewalk. Oh, the, the, the bowl is gone? It's tried? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Why, oh, that's hideous. The markings on that bowl were priceless. Why, Marlowe, great Scott, why was it destroyed? That's what I mean. See, it's screwy. Oh, wait a minute, I'll get it. Hello? Miss Mona Waters, please. It's urgent. Interstate Airlines calling. She's out. I'll take the message. Oh, thank heavens. We want to rectify a perfectly ghastly mistake. We're afraid the relief operator may have given Miss Waters 2.12 a.m. instead of 1.12 a.m. as the departure time of her plane tonight. But maybe it's 12.30 now. If she leaves at 1.12... I she... know. We're just sick about it. Can she make it? I hope not. But I'll do my best to deliver your message in person. You're a dear girl for calling. Goodbye. What was it, Marlowe? Something important? Not archaeologically. I'll see you later. Oh, wait, wait. Isn't there anything we can do about the bowl? Yeah, oh, sure. Get a bottle of glue and a dustpan and hop to it. So long, Erskine. I'm off to the field of the Thunderbirds. <laughs> Now, look, officer, never I was just... Never mind. Well, Mac, you're batting a thousand. You pulled out of the hotel driveway two blocks back, ran one full stop and a red signal getting this far. That's great. So what's your story? Been drinking? Not a drop, believe me. Now, look, I've got to get to the airport in a hurry. Why? Yeah, to catch an Indian girl. A guy named Jimmy Brown Bear was murdered tonight because a bowl was stolen. Wait a and minute, I... wait a minute, hold it. Who was murdered? Oh, I know. What's he? There's no use in going into it. Officer, my name is Marlowe. I'm a private detective working on a case, and i got to get to the airport. Private eye, huh? Let's see your papers. Oh, sure, sure. Here, they're, they're all here. I, I... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Philip Marlowe, license number. Hey, what's eating you? What are mm -hmm. you staring at? Blue-black lines on the palm of my hand. They, they look just like... Holy smoke, they are. That's the answer. I gotta get back to that hotel. It's a matter of life and death. Now, just Please, a minute. give me a ticket. Give me three tickets. Only let me get back to the Walker house right now, will you? Life depends on it. You better be right, Marlowe. Wait till I stop the traffic, then make a U turn. Now, go ahead. <laughs> Made it 
back to the hotel in something under seven minutes for the round trip. I ran for the elevator, waited for the car to come down, and when the gate opened, bumped head on into Clark Erskine himself. I backed him into the elevator again at gunpoint and pushed the fifth floor button. I didn't say a word. By the time the elevator stopped and the gate slid open, he was beginning to sweat. Marlo, I, I, I just don't understand this. Why is it gone? Take a guess, Erskine. I want to know what happened to Mona Waters. Why, I, I don't know. She, she didn't come back. Here, this is 515. Remember, go on, open it up. And get inside. Now listen, you, I know who killed Jimmy Brown Bear, and I found out plenty about the bull, so talk. Where's Mona? Behind you with a gun in my hand, so don't move. Oh, great. Well, at least you're okay. Except for a headache, yes. I just woke up in the bedroom with a heap big lump on my scalp, and I know a pale face who's going to pay for that. Drop your gun, Marlowe. Drop it. Now, who's this character here, and where's the bow? Marlowe headed Miss Waters. I, I saw him hit you and take it. I, I tried to stop him, but he hit me too. My name is Erskine. I'm an archaeologist. I, I only wanted to make a scientific study of the bow, but this vandal here has destroyed it. Destroyed it. Marlowe, I'll down that wing and listen. Before you start shooting, there's a lot of wampum at stake, if nothing else. Now keep that in mind. Okay, Big Wind, stop blowing. Speak your piece and keep it straight. He's a treacherous liar, Miss Waters. I know I'm braced for that. No, oh, you sweetheart, you. All right. The inscription's on that bowl with a key to the treasure, which is probably no news to you two. You didn't know how to work it, Mona. But Erskine here did. He found out that some of the lines were etched into the clay and others were raised, like the face of type in a printing press. Do I go on? I do, Professor. All right, now look. If you look closely, beautiful, you'll see ink on his fingers. Also, you'll notice that a bottle of ink poured out on your desk blotter there made the same kind of ink pad you use for a rubber stamp. That ink was spilled by accident. Now, don't listen to him because... Shut up. Go on, Marlo. Well, after he knocked you out and left you in the bedroom, all he had to do was roll that wide, flat border of the bowl through the ink. Then roll it again over blank paper and it printed. What's more, baby, if we look real close, we'll find a perfect printed map on your hotel stationery stuck in one of his inside no, pockets. No, you don't. You'll never get the chance. Marlo, the guy on the floor is... Doc Motor, lights out. <laughs> Marlo? Marlo, are you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Oh. Then I, I did shoot the right man. Cream and sugar, Miss Walter? Same. Well, that's about the story, Mr. Van Norden. Yeah. Mona here slipped the Indian bowl into your shipment to keep it away from the guys she knew were after it. And, of course, she had to follow the bowl here to L.A. Erskine followed her. I see. Mm. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Positively amazing. Marlo, how did you discover that the intricate pattern on the bowl worked like a printing press? Oh, well, after Erskine had made his print of the map, he threw the bowl out the window to smash it so no one else could duplicate it. I got hold of a chunk of it and clenched it in my hand. I found out later when I passed that cop my credentials that the chunk of pottery had left separate distinct lines of ink on my palm. Terribly clever, isn't he, Mr. Van Loo? Oh, take it easy, baby. Oh. <laughs> Indeed, he is clever, Miss Walters. But what the poor Jimmy Brown Bear? Well, Erskine followed me from the hotel at Jimmy's place and shot him, so I'd never have a chance to talk to him. He was a ruthless little guy, Clark Erskine. But if he survives that bullet wound, the state will get him for murder. Yeah. Oh, Miss Walters, you'll have to hurry and finish your breakfast so that you can catch your plane. Uh, but before you go, I have a little gift for you. <laughs> Excuse me. I'll get it. And Marla, speaking of gifts, I have one for you. Come here. Mm -hmm. Yo, baby, that's nice. <laughs> Is it for Keith? Of course not, silly. I'm an Indian giver, remember? <laughs> when I come to town again, I'll be rich and reckless and loaded with all that old Spanish gold. That's when I'll take my kids back again. With interest. So long, Tilsey. <laughs> finally got home, completely fagged out at 10 o'clock in the morning. I took one look at my favorite chair, the big, deep, soft one, and then sank down into it good and hard. Ow! Ooh, something that felt like a broken beer bottle stabbed me. 
I reached for it, and it turned out to be the jagged chunk of the Indian bowl I dropped in my pocket earlier. For the first time, I really looked at the hieroglyphics on it. There were three Indian figures. The first was breaking sticks into uneven lengths. The second was holding a small fish, and the third was <laughs> running away with all the wampum. It took me a long time, but I finally got it, I think. The Indian picture message could only be translated one way. It had to mean, never give a sucker an even break. And right then and there, I thought about Mona and what she'd said. That's when I'll take my gift back again. With interest. So long, Bill, baby. So long, baby. <laughs> Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore. Tonight's story was produced and directed by Cliff Howell. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Hans Conrad, Clark Gordon, Howard Culver, Peter Leeds, Jane Webb, and Jane Avello. The special music is written and conducted by Richard O'Ron. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... Inside of two hours, a lavish mansion seethed with suspicion. A sealed cabin filled with gas and an artist's retreat had a corpse on the floor. All because one man was too good-looking to be true to anyone. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison, or the grave. This time, inside of two hours, a lavish mansion seethed with suspicion, a sealed cabin filled with gas and an artist's retreat, and a corpse on the floor. All because one man was too good-looking to be true to anyone. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, as we present... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Lady Killer. The longer I sat in my office with my feet up on the desk and thought about it, the more convinced I became. Paul Niles was unquestionably the handsomest man I'd ever seen. He had a face that belonged on a Greek god, only his features were better, more finely chiseled. They looked as though they'd been molded out of alabaster from a blueprint by some inspired genius. And the classic side view he presented made the great profile show up like a bowl full of shredded wheat. In fact, the guy was much too good to be true in more ways than one which had been my original impression of Niles when I'd first met him, just two hours ago at the corner of Sunset and Coenga. And at his insistence, had driven him around the quieter streets of Hollywood in my car while he tried to hire me. He was scared stiff. That was all he would admit to, and as he talked, I wondered what it would be like to have a face like that. It must become quite a problem. Women cluttering up your life. Marlow, you're not listening to me. Unless you help me, I, I'm going to be killed. Soon... Tomorrow, tonight, maybe in the next ten minutes, I must have protection. From what? Who's after you? A girl. Her name is Nora Kirby. She's threatened my life, and now she's here in town. She actually intends to go through with it. I found out where she's staying. I went there to talk to her, but she was out. Why is killing you so important to her? Well, I I don't even know for sure. It's, it's something ridiculous. Mm. Nora Kirby obviously doesn't think so. Let's have it, Niles. Why? I, I, I can't tell you that. I see. Also, I suppose you don't want to take this to the police where it belongs, and you can't give me the reason for that either. Yes. I came to you because I need private help, and I'm willing to pay well for it. Now, you don't have to concern yourself with reasons. Simply see that Nora doesn't get to me. Now, here, as a starter, here's $200 for just that. Keep it. I only accept money from the people I work for. You mean you won't help me? I just want to know where I'm going before I start. Now, wait. You don't can you get off here. Don't you understand? My, my, my life's in danger. I'm scared. Not enough to loosen your tongue, any. Yeah, this is as far as I go. But tell me one thing first, just for laughs. What business are you in? Why, I, 
I'm a composer. I write music. Mm -hmm. The way you said it, it's either a front or a hobby. How do you get your dough? I have friends, wealthy ones, who have faith in me. That's more than I can say for Marlowe. So long, Mr. Niles. Go on. Out. All right. But here, at least take my card and please call if you change your mind. I I'm desperate, Marlowe. I'll pay you even more if you'll only... Goodbye, Mr. Niles. That was the way I'd left it two hours ago at eight. And I'd spent the time in between trying to referee a tug-of-war in progress with the feeling I had that I'd been stuffy on one end and my undernourished bank account on the other. And was slowly but surely getting no place. So when the break came, I grabbed at it. Hello, Marlo speaking. Marlo, this is Paul Niles again. Oh? I've uh, thought it over. I'll tell you everything if that's the only way. Because I've got to have help before it's too late. That's better. Where are you? In my studio, 3893 Avenida del Sol. 3893. That's off Coldwater Canyon, isn't it? Yes. Now get over here right away, will you? I... Wait a minute, Marlo. There's someone here. Somebody just came in now. What? Niles? Who's there? Who is it? Nora, is that you? Oh. Niles! Oh. Niles! When Niles' phone went dead, I hung up, ran to my car, and was headed for Coldwater Canyon before I stopped to think of what I'd heard on the telephone could very easily have been bait for a patsy routine. Because I had nothing more to go on now than before except Niles' promise to tell all that I'd got no further than gunshots. But I was already well on one easy way to find out, so I corkscrewed my way over the mountains to Avenida del Sol and followed it to number 3893, which was a straight-up driveway edged narrowly into the hill face that ended on a gravel shelf just big enough for the redwood and glass studio, the generous helping of imported jungle for landscaping in a circular parking space. As my headlights slashed across the tangle of overhanging trees in the center, they trapped the figure of a woman running. She stopped, crouched, and looked back into the glare like a cat does, then darted to the darkness again. But I caught her at the corner of the house. Oh, Just a minute, no. baby. Not so fast on the curve. Let me go. Let me go. Not until we've been properly introduced and had a chance to talk a lot of things over, Nora. Nora? Yeah, Nora Kirby. Girl with murder on her mind. Oh, no, no, you got the wrong person. My name's not Nora. It's Lynn. I don't know anyone like that. Lynn what? Lynn Horton. Lynn Horton. Mm-hmm. Okay, Lynn Horton. What's inside that got you so panicky you can hardly stand up? Is it Paul Niles? yes. I gotta, I gotta get away from here. And it actually happened, huh? He was shot. Is he dead? I don't know. I think so. How did you know about it? Who are you? Name's Marlowe. Come on, Lynn Horton. Let's take another look. No. No, I, I, I couldn't bear it. Mm. Can't see him through the window. It means you must have been inside. Inside? No. No, I wasn't. Now look, baby. You're too jittery to try to lie. Let's have the key. Come on, give. Oh. It's better. No. After you. Go on inside. Now, where is it? Yeah. Oh, Paul. Paul. Come on, Lynn. Come over here away from me. I, I can't believe it. I can't. What's your connection with him? I, I was just a friend. I tried to help him with his music. Mm hmm. No price on the merchandise you're wearing. You must be one of those mentioned. What do you mean? But you got dough and it shows. Well, we'll skip that. Assuming you didn't kill him, you must have had some reason for showing up here tonight. Where was it? Well, I only wanted to... Did you hear that? Someone's outside. Yeah, get the light. Yeah. There. On the terrace. Something moved down there. I'm going out to see who it is. And listen, there's no such thing as welcome visitor just now, baby. So you stay here, understand? And don't budge. I felt my way out the door, down the stone steps, toward where we'd seen the movement along the wall of the far end of the terrace. But there was no sound. Nothing moved. Whoever had made the noise had gotten away clean. So I headed back to the house, and that's when I heard it. I started after it with my shin against the first rock garden. Stop me cold! Ooh. Instead, I... I listened to her drive away. Called myself a few unpleasant names and concluded that Lynn Horton, or whatever her real name was, had been quite as scared as she acted. After I limped inside, turned on the light, and reached for the phone, I... Stopped at the word Nora above a pretty girl's picture and a newspaper clipping sticking out of Paul Niles' pocket. It carried a New York dateline and said that Nora Kirby, convicted of manslaughter in a traffic accident, had been released after serving three years. At the bottom of the story, scrawled in ink, was the message. Three years for something I didn't do. To get something I couldn't have. It's not fair, Paul. I'll be seeing you. It was signed Nora. I picked up the phone again, and a few minutes later, Detective Lieutenant Matthews at Homicide was up to date. 
you say this girl, Laura Kirby, did it, Marlowe? I said Paul Niles was expecting her to, and it looks like she did. They look, there's another angle, though, the woman who just beat it away from here. The one who called herself Lynn Barton? Yeah, yeah. There's that somebody else who was snooping around outside, too. Who also got away from you. You're doing real well, Marlowe. Oh, now, wait a minute. Wait till you see this joint, you'll understand. Besides, I'm in this for curiosity only. Now my paycheck got murdered, remember? And furthermore, I... Yo, I never have matches when I want them. What'd you say? I said I'm looking for some matches. <laughs> no, here's some. Hmm. These are the strangest matches I've ever seen. Well, what about them? I got a velvet cover on them. So what? A velvet book of matches. Mm. Hey, hey, Matthews, did you ever hear the name Negrotto? Negrotto? Yeah. Uh, sure. Abel Negrotto. Huh? He's a big name in the music publishing business. Made most of his fortune on records. Lives in Beverly Hills. You know, I got a dandy hunch. I'm going to go have a talk with Mr. Negrotto, Lieutenant, okay? On one condition. Be careful what you say, Marlowe. And uh, keep in touch. <laughs> Good evening. You aren't Mr. Negrotto, are you? No, I'm not. I'm Garrett Horton. Mr. Negrotto is busy. Horton? Yes. Something wrong with that? Uh, no. No, it's a more common name than I suspected, that's all. Uh, will you tell Mr. Negrotto I'd like to see him for a few minutes on an urgent matter named Marlowe? Perhaps you didn't understand me. Mr. Negrotto and I are in the middle of a business conference. We can't be disturbed. No, you can't be disturbed. Well, no. look, Mr. Horton, a man was murdered tonight, and one trail leads from the corpse straight to this front door. Either Negrotto talks to me here now or later at police headquarters. You decide. Well, if that's where you feel, come in. You an officer? Not exactly. I'm a private detective. I see. Well, follow me, follow me. He led the way through what looked like the outer lobby of the Taj Mahal. And down a silk-padded corridor to a set of carved doors that would have fit any roundhouse in the country. When we walked in, a man glanced up from a stack of papers and with a pair of eyes that belonged on a shark, it is best to look a hold for me. Horton introduced us. This is Mr. Marlowe, private detective. Uh, Mr. Negrotto, I'm looking for a girl named Nora Kirby in connection with the murder of one Paul Niles tonight. She either committed the murder or knows who did because she was there and saw it. And what exactly brings you to my house? Well, I found this book of matches near the door of the dead man's studio. I, I think it's yours. It is. Go on. Any idea how it got there? None whatever. And until you mentioned their names, I'd never heard of either Nora Kirby or Paul Niles. How about you, Mr. Horton? No, I'm afraid hey, not. Paul. Oh, uh, there's my wife. Oh? I'm sure you'll want to give her the third degree, too. Oh, just a moment. Lynn. Lynn, darling. Come in here, please. Uh, Lynn, uh, this is Mr. Marlowe. How do you do, Mr. Marlowe? I'm glad to know you, I'm sure. Thanks. I'm pleased to meet you, Mrs. Negrotto. Your brother and I have been trying to convince Marlowe here that we didn't commit murder tonight. But he thinks we did because he found this book of our matches near the corpse. Can you explain it, my dear? Why, no. I, I can't imagine. The man's I... name was Niles, Lynn. Paul Niles. Mean anything? No, nothing. How about Nora Kirby? I don't think I've ever heard the name before. Well, Marlowe... That would seem to take care of the book of matches. Not completely. It was found at the house of the dead man, remember? We've had hundreds of these made up. Passed them out freely. I, uh, I think you've taken up quite enough of our time with this absurd business, Marlowe. So now I'll ask you to leave. I'll show you out. Don't Marlo. bother. Now listen to Grotto and listen closely. I've been taking it easy so far, but somebody in this room is absolutely certain how those matches got out there. I know that for a fact. And I'm a private detective. Don't forget... So if you suddenly remember something that needs talking over, I'll be in my office for one hour, but not one single minute longer. Good night, all. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, every Sunday afternoon, CBS brings you two outstanding programs of music. Gems from the great composers played by the symphonette and the sweet memorable songs of the outstanding modern composers and semi-classicists sung by the choral ears. Each program is designed especially for fine Sunday afternoon listening. Hear both the symphonette and choral ears this Sunday afternoon on most of these same CBS stations. 
Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Lady Killer. When I started back to my office on Coenga, I figured that there was an even chance that the double talk I'd left in my weight might stack up in the center of the Negrotto living room floor like so much dynamite which, if touched off by the Book of Matches, could cause an explosion that would jar loose a few facts about the lives and loves of the late Paul Niles. Facts that would make finding Nora Kirby and clearly understanding her motives something less than impossible. And 20 minutes later, when I was slouched behind my desk and listening to the staccato report of a pair of high heels clicking sharply toward my door, I had a hunch that my theory of violent detonation was not just wishful thinking. When the door opened without the formality of the knock, that hunch turned a sure thing because the visitor was the not quite lady called Lynn. Mr. Marlowe. And before she could speak her piece, the phone rang and sure thing graduated to cinch. It was another Negrotto, the one named Abel. Uh, Marlowe, I suppose it's stupid of me to make this call, but frankly, your visit here has left me curious. Uh, you have a minute? Yeah, I think so. Hold a wire, will you? I need a light. Be with you in a second, Mrs. Negrotto. All right, but what I have to say is important, Marlowe. So make it fast, will you? Just as fast as I can. I don't think your husband has much to say to me. Husband? Mm-hmm. That's Abel you're talking to? Yeah. Now, do you mind handing me those matches there? Thanks. Hello. <laughs> Sorry to have kept you waiting, Mr. Negrotto. I never <laughs> seem to be able to hang on to matches. Uh, that's odd. You apparently did all right on that score tonight, Marlo. Is that the reason for the call? Uh, more or less. Marlo, uh, you know as well as I do that servants, getter, anyone who's ever been in my home could have left those matches near the body of that Paul Niles. That's right, Mr. Negrotto, anybody. Which also includes you, your wife, your brother-in-law, and others in the family I've still to meet. What's your point, please? I'm in a hurry. Very well. Marlo, I called to find out if you're holding anything back from me. If this murder concerns the Negrottos beyond the appearance of those matches. I can't say. Uh, because there is something. Because I don't know. Anything else? Uh, no, there isn't. Uh, I... Yes, Marlo. There is. Oh. To be honest, I admire the way you handle the situation. What's your address? I may have work for you soon. Tonight. Thanks, Mr. Negrotto, but I don't think I'll be available. At least not till I get through with the job I'm on. Which is what? Handling dynamite while I play with books of matches. Good night, sir. What did he want, Ma? Among other things, an express desire to hire me. To do what? Report on you, I suppose. He didn't say. What makes you think that's what he wanted? Addition, Mrs. Negrotto. A rich old husband, a beautiful but bored young wife, and an unemployed Adonis always add up the same way. Also, you were here in my office just about clenches things, not to mention your presence near the corpse, the key you used. And I've heard enough, Marlowe. Look, I didn't want to get mixed up with Paul. I couldn't help myself. I swear I couldn't. He was different, Marlowe. Handsome. More charm than I've ever known in anyone. Yeah, real lady killer, I know. What are you getting at? Just this. I'll pay you any price you name. Only don't tell Abel that I had anything to do with Niles. He's a jealous man, Marlowe. Insanely jealous. If he knew about us, he'd... Kill Mrs. Negrano? I don't know. Marlowe, what do you want? Right now, everything you know about Nora Kirby. But I've never heard of her before tonight. You're lying. No, I'm not. It's the truth. No. No, what do you want? Nothing. Good night. You... You mean you won't say anything? Oh, Marlo, I, I don't know how to thank you. Don't try. Also, don't get mixed up about me, baby. The fact that I won't blackmail you doesn't mean I don't like you. And the door, Mrs. Negrotto, leave it open on your way out, will you? I'm expecting another visitor. No, my husband. No, just another man. The anchor man on a triumvirate I once left some dynamite with. I won't bother explaining that. Goodbye, Mrs. Negrotto. You great, big, beautiful girl. Oh. Come on in, Mr. Horton. I've been waiting for you. Why, Mr. Marlowe? Something I said or didn't say at the house? Not exactly. It's more a matter of intuition, high explosives, and the fact that both your brother-in-law and sister have already paid their respects. Now, what can I do for you? I'm not at all sure. It's the first time. I'm only here because I noticed something very strange about the way my sister looked at you when you spoke of the murder of this Paul Niles. When she left the house shortly after you, did I follow her here? All of which makes the next question, why, Mr. Horton? Because I don't trust her, 
And more important, every penny I own is tied up in a business venture of mine that her husband is backing. She originally met Abel through me, and if she should in some way be in trouble, the kind of trouble that her husband wouldn't put up with, I might suffer for it in the long run right along with her. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, by the trouble, Mr. Horton, you're referring to something specific, I think. I am. Mm -hmm. Lynn has had a very, uh, well, a very mixed-up background, Marlowe, so it's entirely feasible that in some way she's connected with this Nora you spoke of who killed Paul Niles. You mean as an accomplice or even as accessory before or after the fact? (laughs) Pretty thoughts about your own sister. Which I can't help. I doubt that you have anything to worry about, Mr. Horton. However, I will say this, that if Nora Kirby hadn't gotten a Paul Niles, sooner or later, you would have had plenty to worry about. You mean that... I mean that now's a great time for you to go home and sit on your investment. All is well, Mr. Horton, for the time being. The moment after Horton left the office, I came to the hollow conclusion that although my little bombshell had exploded on schedule, damages had been light and had jarred loose neither fact nor fancy about the late Paul Niles, and much less about the elusive Miss Nora Kirby. So my next move had to be a second trip to Avenida del Sol and a report to Detective Lieutenant Matthews, which is what I was about to do when it came from someplace outside, long and loud. ran the length of the corridor outside my door, then bellowed down the single flight of stairs to the street where in the half-light of a distant lamppost, I saw the shadowed figure of a girl slip behind my car, then dart toward a storefront nearby. I started after her and stopped at a noise behind me, which was a... Oh, mistake! Oh. Hey. Oh. Junior, hey, come on, honey. Pull yourself together. Oh. Let's go, fellas. Come on. Oh, it's you. You're the one who screamed? Scream? Honey, you have got it bad. Listen, uh-huh. this is just Sally. Hello, Sally. <laughs> Relax, honey. You're, you're lucky a cop didn't come along first. Being drunk is one thing. The DTs is something else, I know. Last year, I was in the same shape, and it took me three months. Now, wait get... a minute. Hold it, will you? Look, I was slug, not slipped a Mickey. Slug? Honest? Slug. Honest. Now, if you don't mind giving me a hand, I'll get up. Ooh. Easy, Ooh. honey. Here, let me help you. I'm sorry. Oh. I figured you're all wrong. I never thought you were slug. Any idea who done it? No, no. Look, tell me, didn't you see anything uh-uh. before you found me, honey? Uh-uh. Didn't hear a girl scream, see her run away? Nothing at all. Oh. Honey, you must have been out longer than you thought. Maybe. Hmm? Hey. Hey, look, this, this card here on the ground. Yeah. What's your name, honey? Philip Marlowe, why? Why, well, I tell you why. I'll tell you more than that. You know who slugged you, honey? A polite guy. A very polite guy who left his card yeah, engraved in all. Paul Niles, know him? I used to. It won't work, Swedes. Niles gave me that card earlier tonight. Must have dropped it just now. Also, Niles is dead in that you. And what? Back of that card there in pencil. Give me what? that, will you? Gray's Motel, 1000 Santa Monica Boulevard, Bungalow 9. Sweetheart, I may have something good here. About who slugged you, you mean? Better than that, about who killed Niles and where she can be found. By love, here's five for your trouble and bless you. As I piled into my car, I knew that putting Niles' conversation piece about having just come from Nora's place when he first met me, together with the address on the back of his card, was taking a lot for granted. But I sold myself that playing a long shot was better than not betting on anything at all, and I kept driving fast. But I came to a stop away from the place which was run down, spread out, and quiet. I had the feeling that what I had earmarked long shot was quickly moving up to even money. And when I was standing next to the motel bungalow Mark 9, that feeling became fact because inside and piled in an awkward heap on the floor was a still form of a girl the newspaper clipping had labeled Nora Kirby. It was another full second before I realized something even more important. On a hot night in August, there wasn't a single window open. And Nora Kirby was huddled close to a gas heater that was on but showed no flame. I picked up a stone at my feet, took one deep breath, and then crashed the pane of glass, unlocked the window, and got inside and over the girl, who I figured was taking the hasty way out of a murder that she no doubt had a very personal reason to commit. I stopped figuring when I was nearly next to her. I knew that she was still alive. And that a man gripping a forty-five in his hand had just opened the front door. Don't make another move, Marlowe, or I'll kill you. Well, comes the switch. Brother-in-law Garrett Horton. I never would have guessed. You wouldn't have had to try if you'd kept your nose clean. No. Get away from her. Why? So she can die as a suicide, which the police will chalk off as logical, since she's already wanted for murder that you no doubt committed? Exactly. Murder I committed because there isn't anything worse one can do to a blackmailer. 
Well, that's it, Niles. The lady killer was blackmailing your sister. You found out and killed him before he could cause too much trouble. <coughs> <laughs> Family trouble that would end up hurting the good thing you've got with husband Abel, huh? Yes. No, shut up and get away from her. We're going outside. You're kidding. Marlo. Mar- Marlo, I'll shoot you if you don't start walking. You're still kidding. Horton, you can't kill me without killing yourself. <laughs> this room is jammed tight with the gas you turned on after you brought her in here unconscious. After you sapped her outside of my place because she was on her way to see me and tell me that you had murdered Niles. The flash from that gun in your hand, Horton will blow us all to bits. Face it, brother. For you, it's all or nothing at all. Go on, shoot. Go on, try it. Try it. I can't. I can't. <laughs> You can see Miss Kirby now, Mr. Marlowe. She's going to be all right, but uh, hold her down to a few minutes, will you? All right, Doctor, just a few minutes. Hello, Nora. Been a long time getting together, huh? No, but not through any fault of mine, Mr. Marlowe. I followed you from the moment you left Paul's place. But I wanted to see you alone, so I kept waiting for my chance. Which was canceled out when Horton spotted you after he left my office. Hmm. You had to learn to run faster, honey. He had to take time to knock me out, and still he caught up with you. So did you. I'm very glad to say. Even though you probably weren't trying to save me at the time, were you? Mm-hmm. Frankly, honey, until Horton stepped back into that bungalow to keep me from interfering with things, I figured you were it. I might have been, Marlo. If Paul hadn't been killed just before I got to him, at least I'd have hit him with something hard. I had motive, you know. Yeah, I read all about it. Three years in prison for something he didn't do. But tell me, if Niles framed you and you knew it, why didn't you go to the police? He couldn't have been that irresistible. But he was, Marlo. And more. As a matter of fact, he didn't frame me in the first place. It was my own idea. You see, Paul was driving the car when we we had that accident three years ago. Not me. You switched places with him? Mm -hmm. Why? He'd already had his license revoked for reckless driving. They'd have sent him away for ten years at least. As against my three. Believe it or not, at the time, I couldn't think of waiting that long for him. No? Mm. No, Marlo? Hello, Matthews. We checked the story. It's true enough, even if it's the kind of thing we're not supposed to be able to understand. Of course. Paul was strictly a lady killer, remember? Yeah, so he was. Well, I guess that ties everything in, huh? Not quite, Phil. I just finished taking a statement from Horton. There's one more question. Whatever made you so sure that in a room half filled with gas, a gun exploding would blow everything up? Oh, well, that's simple. I, I, uh, uh, I, uh... You what? Well, I I figured, you see. I I thought that, uh... (laughs) Yes, well, good night, Miss Kirby. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. So long, Lieutenant. So long. Lucky. By the time I got back to the quiet of my apartment on Franklin, it was a little better than two in the a.m. As I sank into an easy chair without bothering to turn on the lights, I realized that for the moment I was tired. Tired of people. Their troubles, their petty little jealousies. <laughs> lady killer. What makes one man a lady killer and another... Oh, well. I lit a last cigarette, and I thought about the mountain of trouble a classic Grecian profile had built for Paul Niles. I stopped thinking when the flare of the match in my hand showed in a mirror opposite me. The mirror that also reflected the face of the guy holding the match. Hmm. It was a long way from being an Adonis. Hmm. In fact... (laughs) It was slightly on the mud fence side. Hmm. And at the moment, glad of it. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. 
Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, Paul Dubov, Ted Von Elts, Ann Morrison, Don Randolph, and Edmund McDonald. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with a man on trial for his life, and an A-1 citizen eager to testify. But there it was interrupted. And it wasn't until I found a corpse in a bubbling bath, gunplay in the woods, and lots of blackmail, that the real eager witness had a chance to talk. (laughs) 